Well, welcome everybody. Uh, glad you're here today. Uh, I'm excited about this and I hope you are too. Uh, it's been a crazy year with all the weather and uh, I'm hoping to help help you uh, get through this uh, next season of beekeeping and uh, I'll just get started here. Um, so we are in the uh, Working Your Colonies class. Um, the uh, What did you sign up for? I'll start with just what we're doing here today. Um, working your colonies is for novice beekeepers who already have a colony and are taking the beginner beekeeping class and want to develop their beekeeping skills further. This is straight from the, uh, the information you signed up for. You're gonna have the opportunity to ask questions in our online classroom. So um, basically at the end of each uh, session and the break, uh, we'll have a question and answer period. And then at the end of the, if I can get through everything in time, we'll have uh, more questions at the end. So if you have questions, I think Kian already said, put them in the chat. Let's, uh, let's do that. All right. Uh, our objectives today, uh, in the syllabus, it said that we were going to talk about products of the hive and honey extraction. But uh, really, the, the main thing I'm going to focus on today is uh, a little bit of advanced honeybee biology, some IPM, uh, splitting and combining colonies, monitoring for varroa and, and queen wrangling. Um, I want to uh, spend a, a first part of this uh, in a uh, kind of a review of some of the laws and things that, uh, that you need to know about. So uh, although it's a little bit dry, it is important. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll go over that here in just a minute. And of course, this is remote. Uh, we also recommend that you have the honeybee colony uh, installing a honeybee package and honeybee health uh, seminars prior, prior to this. But uh, if you don't, if you haven't looked at them, uh, you can always go back and, and look at them after. So what, who am I and what, what do I do? Uh, what are my goals and my experience? Well, um, I started beekeeping with my dad in 75. Uh, I had a cousin who, uh, he was uh, really into beekeeping uh, and, and uh, probably had 50 to 100 hives. Uh, eventually, he became allergic to bees and, and gave it up. But he got my dad and me started in beekeeping. And as I was growing up, I, uh, I really enjoyed it, uh, both working with him and, and really uh, get, it gets in your blood, you know. So I, uh, I always carried it with me wherever I went, just had, had an interest in beekeeping. Um, I went to college at A&M. Uh, took a break from about 83 to 1994 as I got out of college and worked and started a family. From about 94 to 2015, I, I, uh, I got back into beekeeping and I was a member of uh, Mount Diablo Beekeepers Association, but uh, I didn't ask for or get much help. So I, I just sort of did things wrong and did them by chance and luck rather than real knowledge. Uh, as I started to um, really have more and more problems with my bees, though I realized I needed a lot more help and I joined uh, camp in, in 2020. Uh, after that, I got on the Mount Diablo Beekeeper Board as the VP of Member Development uh, about a year and a half or two years ago. And, um, and then I, as part of my master capstone for the, the camp program, I started the hub for the Mount Diablo Beekeepers Association. We've graduated 10 people last year, and I think we have 16 in our class this year for Apprentice. Uh, all 10 of the ones from last year and, and a couple that were uh, through this through the program earlier have joined in, and I think we have 12 going through journey level right now. So very exciting for, the, for that, and, and uh, it's really made a difference in our organization. My goals uh, are to help provide healthy habitat for bees, to operate a small business selling honey bees, uh, performing structural removal and mentoring beekeepers. So that tells you a little bit about what I do um, and why I'm a beekeeper. Uh, I am currently running about 20 hives, 20 to 25. Um, gets down to about 15 sometimes in the uh, winter. Uh, and I consolidate and, and uh, lose a few hives. Uh, I own uh, creature apiaries and I'm, um, I have a website at diablovalleybees.com. So 
you're welcome to contact me after this. If you have any questions, feel free. Um, and I would be happy to, to help any way I can. All right. So uh, again, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, but uh, I want you all to know, uh, you can come back and look at this later. Uh, and then uh, I, want, I really wanna save time for questions if I can. So uh, I'll just move through some of this pretty quick. So what are the things you can get out of a hive? Honey, wax, bee venom, royal jelly, pollen, propolis, bees. Um, there's a lot of things that come out of a, a beehive. Uh, what, what are your goals? Uh, it's very important to start with uh, an idea of what you want. Now that idea can change. I started with, hey, I just wanna have one or two beehives. Then I wanted to have four or five beehives as, you, as I you know, got into it more. And then I started thinking, well, it'd be fun to sell some honey. Then it's fun to do this and that. And you know, I started doing more and more. So you have to have goals though to start with because that'll tell you how you're gonna run your bees. Um, you may want to pollinate your garden and, and just something really simple as that. You, want to, you may want to start a business, get some honey to give to relatives and neighbors, watch the bees do their thing, uh, teach others about uh, beekeeping. You may want to have two hives or 20 hives, or maybe you want to get into it big time and get a thousand or more hives. Um, keep bees naturally with organic techniques. Uh, that's, a, that's a goal for many beekeepers. And uh, of course, there's many other reasons. So I just want you to think about uh, what are your goals as you, uh, uh, you know, work through your beekeeping uh, year and, and through the, the years, plural. Uh, let's see, I think I've got uh, stuck. Um, so uh, getting straight to the point, we're gonna talk about regulations. Uh, we'll go through that first. Before getting bees, I expect everyone to know the rules for your homeowners association, your city, your county, and your state. So I'm gonna give you some, some materials here that will help you get through that, but you do need to know this information. Um, you need to follow the laws and uh, regulations uh, so you not become a lawbreaker. I would expect you to know where to get information about the state, county, city laws. The laws are, placed to keep, uh, are in place to keep everyone safe. So you can go to the camp webinars. There's a, a great YouTube there to watch uh, on this topic by Leah Taylor, and she goes through a lot of information. There are quite different laws depending on whether you're in Southern California uh, or no, Northern California. So you need to be aware that, uh, and, and city by city, the laws do change. Um, beware uh, is the uh, facility that we use online, uh, facility that we use to, to register our hives. Um, this gives the ag commissioners an idea where, where your hives are so that uh, they can uh, inform you if there's gonna be pesticide spray, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and, it, and it just kind of keeps an eye on, on how uh, many beekeepers there are and where they're located in the state. So that's uh, through Beware and it's very simple to register. Um, that is changing right now as the laws are moving from the county towards the state and they're in negotiations for uh, how they're gonna manage that. So even, I think if you, if you register for Beware right now, although it's normally for just less than nine hives, it's like $10. Um, uh, and it may be free, excuse me, if it's over nine hives, it's $10. So it's, it's free if you have only one or two hives. But um, I believe uh, my, my last conversation with our county ag commissioner said uh, that this is all changing. So just register and then hold and, and they probably won't charge you for anything at this point until they get it all figured out at the state level. There are some great resources. Uh, the California Department of Food and Agriculture has a lot of information about how to uh, get your hives uh, uh, in compliance, what you need for labeling, what you need for registration, what you need for if you plan to move your hives. 
Uh, there's a whole different uh, set of uh, implications when you're transporting your hives from one place to another. So I, I provide these uh, uh, links here to, to give you uh, a reference to the, um, the resources. Um, there's also uh, some, some great uh, information uh, about how the laws uh, are um, applied and what to expect. So uh, I, I just uh, leave you with another link here that really helps you understand what's happening in California. Uh, county level, uh, the, probably the, the best example of, of, of the regulations is in San Diego. So if you're ever in a situation as a beekeeper and you want to uh, look at what's, what are the best uh, written regulations, go to San Diego. They have the biggest problem with Africanized bees. So uh, they really do uh, have quite a bit of, of code uh, text and, and law uh, regulations that, uh, that help. I put the Contra Costa ones, that's the ones I use um, for this area here. But uh, you know, basically the, the idea here is that you have, you have uh, quite a bit of information available to you. You just need to look it up and uh, and make sure that you're in compliance. All right. Um, oop, Pharaoh, I'll skip right past it. Go back here. Ah, here we go. Um, so uh, there's also uh, uh, federal laws, uh, just more reference information about how to. Uh, um, how to keep bees and at the federal level. And, and really a lot of this has to do with uh, transporting bees across state lines. Uh, if you're planning on doing any pollination, that sort of thing, or moving your bees to other areas, it's important to understand uh, the, the federal government kind of treats bees like livestock. So there are rules that, uh, that apply and you need to be aware of those rules. Um, Importation of used equipment is restricted. So if you think about it, uh, there's a lot of a lot of issues uh, with the health uh, and health concerns with uh, using used equipment. So you really want to be aware that that's problematic, and and uh, you want to protect the bees and the beekeepers, uh, not use uh, used equipment uh, unless you really know that it's in good shape and it's been cleaned up. Um, yeah, don't keep Africanized bees. Uh, pretty simple, uh, uh, but for, for me up here, it's easy because we don't really have Africanized bees up here. And I'll show you more information on that later, but uh, we do have defensive bees and there is a, uh, a uh, um, there, there are regulations about this. The biggest issue we have is down in Southern California, particularly in San Diego. So if you're down in that area, um, it's even more important to be and under, understand what the laws are and requeening uh, issues. If you're going to, uh, you can't raise queens in San Diego because of that, um, because the, they tend to breed with the Africanized bees. So the regulation reads in the absence of a, um, here, let me go to the next slide. Uh, in the absence of a local ordinance adopted pursuant to the subdivision, uh, if a commissioner determines the presence of Africanized or overly defensive honeybees in a hive is a public nuisance, or if Africanized or defensive honeybees from a hive are entering land other than the land upon which the hive is located, uh, endangering public health or welfare, then they create an un, uh, unreasonable interference and use the property of others. So basically, the idea here is, uh, if your if your bees become a public nuisance, uh, they have the right to dispose of them. And I, I don't think this happened. This certainly doesn't happen in our area. But uh, the idea here is to be aware. I'm going to go back to this site. Like, even if it isn't the law. It's the smart thing to do. Having uh, defensive bees uh, is not good neighbor uh, policy. You know, um, I, I just hit this all the time. I know there's a certain level of fear out there of bees and we all have to deal with that, but uh, making sure that you're not creating a, a hazard and a nuisance 
helps all beekeepers. And there are plenty of people who do want bees on their property. So um, please be aware and uh, keep your bees gentle, use uh, good genetics. And if your hive is becoming defensive, um, requeen. It's, it's just whether you buy a queen or you make a queen, depending on your area, it's a good idea. Okay, so this will give you a little more idea. This always comes up. What's happening with the Africanized bees? So um, this was from a 2015, ooh, sorry, 2015 study. And if you look, this just talks about the genetics of uh, the red dots are where they, they're 100% um, Africanized bee genes. And, and then the circles with the red outline are partly, and the green are no, no uh, 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 scutellata genetics. It's scutellata is the, is the uh, um, species of, uh, of the bee. So, um, and you can see in Northern California, uh, in Central and Northern California, they really didn't find any in this study. Now that's uh, one, they, they looked at it in one way. Here's another study that just looked at the percent of the, of the genome in the, the Africanized genome in the bees. And you see, I put in, uh, this is not from the study, but I put in roughly where the 34th and the 37th parallel are. Um, there's a lot of literature that says they really don't go much above the 34th parallel. And it's the same down in, um, in the Southern hemisphere. I think uh, roughly the latitude of, of Buenos Aires is um, in, in Argentina is the same as our latitude up here. And you find that they don't go south of Buenos Aires either. So basically what we're looking at is uh, that the, the Africanized bees, um, you know, the genetic, by the time they reach the Bay Area up here, um, they're very low um, percent of that uh, genetic line. All right, so there are city ordinances. Um, and um, how they how you keep chickens, pigeons, rabbits, it's all found in that same kind of area. Uh, where you can put them in your in your property, how far from the fence, how what kind of structure you need to have for the the bees, that sort of thing. That's all included in a lot of your city ordinances. There's a, a, a not, quite a few cities that, that just don't really say much about it. I think my city is that way. They don't say uh, very much in their charter about what, uh, what, whether you can have bees or not. So it's kind of left up to uh, some of the neighbors. Now, uh, if your city is actually um, starting to look at this issue, and they're starting to make looking at making laws. Be aware and get involved because uh, you know you can get one or two people uh, that will will fight hard to uh, keep beekeepers from having bees on their property. And uh, that if you need help, uh, I know that uh, the folks at uh, UC Davis are are happy to give you information and help towards uh, uh, helping cities construct good. Uh, uh, policy. So, uh, down in San Diego, there's some great resources uh, within the uh, uh, Camp uh, California Master Beekeeper Program and the uh, uh, Nino Lab for how different cities actually um, manage bees. So, I put this up not because I'm aware of it or know, know how this works, but there is very much information about how to uh, manage bees in each city and, and uh, um, really just be aware and, and make sure you're, you're uh, um, abiding by the laws. Um, so uh, going back to the UC Davis resources, um, there are some really good uh, informational um, uh, programs. Um, if you're putting bees in for the first time, I don't know how many people in this group are, are uh, uh, Keon, do we have a, a results from the survey at all? I could launch the survey right now if you'd like the poll. Let's just kind of get a feel for who's here. 
Yeah. Let's do it. So the questions are how many hives you currently have, and also how many hives did you lose this winter? Any other questions, Pete? Or no. Okay. Okay. So um, while you're thinking about that and answering the question, um, there's a great uh, document within the um, uh, the information database on the, the camp website uh, about bees in the neighborhood. And it just tells you some of the things you should be thinking about when you put your bees in, and you install your bees in your yard. Um, oh, I see. I've got the poll up here. I've got a there we go. Now I should be back to the there we go. Uh, beekeeping webinars. There's a there's quite a few webinars uh, to give you ideas about how to manage your bees. Um, certainly uh, this course is a good one, but uh, but there's many others, including this course given by other people. Uh, Elena did one uh, and she's got a lot more information uh, kind of related to her expertise and you can uh, you can look at that too. Um, what to do about defensive honeybees. Um, those are important things to know too. Uh, I, in my uh, experience, I've had to kill several hives and, and uh, because they were too defensive. They, weren't Africanized, but there's a time when they get really defensive and you just, you can't, you can't take that chance if you've got neighbors, you've got to, you got to get rid of the hive. Um, the, they wanted to reiterate the bees in the neighborhood document because I really like that. It's, it's got a, uh, a great, um, just a review of the, th the criteria uh, that you need to consider when you're uh, setting up your hives, um, how to keep it from being a nuisance and, uh, um, you know, kind of a living document that you will allow you, to, uh, allow us to make adjustments and things as we go. Um, so in, in conclusion here, just know the laws, understand how they impact your, um, you know, what you're trying to set up in your yard and, and make sure that if you do have some an apiary set up that you're in compliance. All right. Now we're going to move on and talk about bees. <laughs> so finally, um, the uh, basic outline, basic things I'm going to talk about are development, communication, and morphology. It's important to understand uh, some of these basic concepts and, and I think the reason why everybody's here is to, to get a better feel for the, the way bees uh, live and work and what they do, their biology and morphology, so that we can understand how to better interact and manage uh, our beehives. And, um, so I will dive right in here. Um, basically, uh, when the developmental stages of a, uh, a bee that starts when the queen lays an egg. And then uh, as she matures um, or the egg matures, uh, it becomes after three days, it becomes a larva. Um, the larval stage lasts about, depending on the type of uh, bee that's being raised, whether it's a worker, a drone or a queen, uh, it goes about six days as a worker. And uh, um, then it becomes a pupa, moves into a pupal stage. And finally, it uh, emerges as an adult. After 21 days for a worker, well, we're gonna go through that next, let's go here. Um, I, I like this slide and I like this way of looking at it. This is something as a beekeeper that I just tell everybody that I mentor and work with, this is something you need to memorize. You need to understand uh, exactly how the life cycle of the, the bee, the developmental cycle of the bee works. This is very important when you have a, uh, miss, you know, you lose a queen, whether it's a swarm or you damage her in the hive, or you, know, you need to know how long it's gonna take for her to be replaced. You need to understand workers. 
when you're looking at a, a frame, what stage are the workers in, and, and are you seeing everything that that you know shows that they're healthy? And of course, uh, when drones are around this time of year, uh, understanding how they, um, what their timeline is, and how they interact with the queen. So, I really highly recommend, and I use these numbers all the time. It's just becomes part of beekeeping to say, oh yeah, I can see this egg is three days old. This egg is looks like it's new. Uh, we've got larva that's just ready to be capped. I can I can graft from a two one to two day old larva. I know the size of that. I know uh, you know pupil stages. Once it starts to pupate, you can't tell, but you can look at the bees around and you can kind of tell well based on where they are on the frame. You know, and there's just so much information you get out of understanding this, this timeline. I, I want to really emphasize that. So how do the queen and the worker uh, develop differently? Um, we like to say that every uh, egg that's laid, every, every uh, uh, fertilized egg is a princess. Uh, they are a potential queen, and it all depends on how they're fed. So uh, if, if a egg is laid, uh, the first three days, the egg uh, sits in the bottom of the cell. And then it, as a, a first day, it's laid, generally speaking, straight up. Second day, it chips to about 45 degrees. And the third day, it lays down. And, and by the end of the day, the shell melts and it, um, it starts to uh, uh, pupate. Excuse me. It becomes a larva, and it starts to grow from there. The, the worker bees put a uh, little puddle of royal jelly around it, and they um, uh, begin to raise it. So, what happens at that point if it's going to be a queen? They're continuously fed royal jelly, uh, which is a special protein with uh, royal actin and, and contains other uh, juvenile hormones and things. Uh, certain plant compounds are absent. Uh, after three days of royal jelly, the workers are fed brood food. So what happens is, uh, in order to keep every every uh, worker bee from becoming a queen, they shift the diet. And by doing that, it um, I don't know if anyone knows for sure, but the things that I've read say it uh, suppresses the uh, growth of the reproductive organs and pushes them more towards uh, the uh, um, you know, the variations in the morphology. So, um, so queens versus workers, what's the difference? Uh, anatomical, behavioral, physiological, physiological differences. Um, the uh, queens have more ovaries. Um, if you look at the uh, basic ovary package here, uh, the, uh, See if I can do this. Okay, so right here you've got the uh, uh, ovaries in a queen. They're they're huge. They're they're loaded with eggs and ready to go. On a worker, they do have ovaries, but there's much fewer. And and for those of you who know, you can have a, a worker um, in a queenless colony. A worker can become a, a laying uh, female, and she will lay multiple eggs, but they're they're all going to be drones, um, but the queen will have, you know, she's prepared to lay a thousand eggs a day for up to five years. So that uh, that's a lot of a lot of eggs. And I say that that's seasonal. Obviously, this time of year, they, she might be laying one to two thousand eggs a day, and then in the in the fall, she would stop. But you get the idea. Um, the queen has a spermatheca. Uh, which holds the sperm and, and delivers it to uh, fertilize the egg as it's being deposited. So um, she has a, uh, a uh, the worker bees have a pollen basket and, and uh, orbicular hairs. The queen does not. Um, barb stinger uh, on the workers, not on the queen. Uh, and then of course, there's quite a difference in the glandular structure in, in the queens and the workers uh, and the drones. Uh, the the uh, mandibular gland of the queen produces pheromones uh, and uh, the 
uh, hypopharyngeal gland for the workers uh, makes royal jelly. That's that's kind of what, I'm sure that's what we're looking at here is hypopharyngeal gland. So let's see. Um, more queen versus workers, the uh, queen's mate, uh, obviously, they reproduce and they produce pheromones. Uh, the workers have in-hive tasks and they're foragers. There's a thing called temporal polytheism, polyethism, sorry. Um, and, and that's how the bees change, uh, the gene expression within the bees changes over their life and it drives different uh, task uh, uh, performance in the bees. So the bees start out as newborn bees cleaning and they move towards uh, uh, nursing tasks. And then they move towards middle age bees and uh, with different tasks. And then they become foragers at the end. So there's a, there's a lot more detail in this, but you get the idea that um, some people call this plasticity and that's really not the correct term. It's polyethism is the right term. Plasticity is the ability of the bees to move back and forth. It, it, this is flexible. You can have a forager in a, in a hive uh, after they swarm, uh, the foragers go out with the bees and they'll go back to being a, um, uh, you know, a nurse, they can go back to being a cleaner in, in the hive, they can go back to being a guard bee, they, you know, they're, they're doing these tasks that they used to have, but their, their uh, genes have kind of shifted and they're, uh, they've gone down the path towards forager, they can, they can move back and forth. That's plasticity. Uh, temporal polyethism is the, just the structure of this whole sort of um, life cycle for the bees. Um, so there's a term called instars. Uh, that's just a, a term for molt. Uh, when the bees uh, molt, uh, excuse me, the, when the larva molt, they're, they're, they have five instars or five molts, and they are uh, developing into different, um, you know, the developmental stages. So the um, by the fifth instar, the fifth molt, there are significant differences between the ovaries and the, and the different casts. So basically all this is happening, uh, the queen and the worker development is happening in those first, um, uh, or the, the, in the last three instars where the first two would happen on royal jelly and then the last three basically happen when the workers are fed a different diet. Uh, Widespread aptosis occurs in the worker uh, ovaries, which appears to be mediated in part by juvenile hormones. So basically that's the change in the feed uh, causes a change in the, um, in the development. Uh, adult queens possess 150 to 180 ovaries, while adult workers will typically have four to seven functional ovaries. And uh, the only way that the, uh, the workers will ever lay eggs is if they're completely queenless and queenless for quite some time. That It takes a while for the workers to uh, get back up and you may have multiple workers laying eggs in a queenless colony. So, uh, and there's no, no physical difference uh, to my knowledge that you can tell a laying worker from a, um, a regular worker bee. They just are in there and, and you couldn't, you can't tell. Um, okay. So how do they uh, rear new queens? What's the, what's the nature of, of why they would do this and, and how does it work? Um, there are three basic ways that you would want to have a new queen or the bees want to have a new queen. And that's first is reproduction. They just want to swarm and make a new queen. The old queen leaves with the, with the field bees and uh, because of various reasons, um, the hot colony gets crowded this time of year and they um, decide it's time to go. The uh, workers leave, or the, excuse me, the uh, real bees leave and the queen goes with them and they land in the tree. 
Supersedure is a second way. Um, if there's a problem, maybe the queen gets injured or she's laying few, um, only a few eggs, um, she will uh, be superseded. They, they, will, um, they will identify the fact that she is no longer performing and they will either kick her out, uh, kill her, or just let her go in the hive and, and start making new, new queens. And they'll take a two-day-old larva and they will, uh, one to two-day-old larva, and they will just expand the cell and um, uh, start feeding royal jelly continuously to those cells um, that they pick. And uh, that, that will form a new queen. Uh, or queens, and then the first one out usually fights with the rest or kills them, and uh, and uh, there's a supersedure of the old queen. At that point, the old queen would leave or or die or, or be kicked out. Um, emergency queens. Uh, so let's say you're in your hive and you roll the queen. Uh, some reason in the hive she dies. Uh, this happens occasionally, and and they will make an emergency queen. So uh, the queen is replaced pretty much the same way. They'll, they'll look for a two day old uh, larva and they will just make a new uh, queen that way. So they all have different identification in, in the way you look at the frame and how you manage that. But uh, supersedure and emergency cells uh, generally are in the top third of the frame and swarming cells tend to be on the bottom. That doesn't always happen. It's just, um, there's plenty of times you'll see, like in this picture here, uh, you'll see that the, uh, you can have um, both emergency cells and swarm cells, depending on how the, the frame is made. Sometimes you'll see swarm cells along the sides also. So um, just be careful about, you know, holding too tightly to the where they are on the frame. Okay, basic queen biology. Um, the queens from egg to birth is 16 days. As we went back to that chart, that's the 16 days for a queen. You've got 21 days for a worker and 24 for a drone. So uh, when the queen emerges after 16 days, uh, she's a virgin. She will search out capped queen cells and kill the individual inside. Now, what you usually, the way you usually see that is that uh, right in along the backside of the cell, uh, there will be a hole. And I don't know this for a fact, but the way I always viewed this, the queen inside has still got a soft cuticle. Her, her. Uh, basically the, the outside of her body, the shell, is soft while she's in here and it needs to get out and into the air to dry out and become hard. So if the virgin queen that comes out can get to her quickly, tear a hole in the side and stick her stinger in, it's easy for her to kill this queen. Once she's out and her cuticle gets hard, I've seen multiple times where I've seen bees trying to sting a queen and they just don't seem to be able to get through the cuticle. They usually wrap around and try to sting at the, at the junction of her, her head and her thorax, on her thorax and her abdomen. There's some soft spots there, but oftentimes they just ball her because they, 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 they surround her and try to cook her basically if they're, uh, if they're out and, and, uh, and trying to kill the queen. So the, the uh, but when one queen tries to kill the other, it's always most effective if she can just break the cell open and, and kill her that way. Um, if you have a single virgin queen, uh, she will survive and mate generally within a week. And then after another roughly three to five days, she's ready to lay eggs. The total time from um, six, from day 16 to, Day 28, that's about 12 days uh, if you add it up. But roughly speaking, my, my understanding, the average for a mated queen ready to go is 28 days. Um, that can vary to 30, depending on temperature, depending on 
uh, you know, the, the strength of the hive. There's many factors in there, but if you get to about day 35 and she's not laying, there's probably a problem and you need to be careful about that. Um, yeah, after she's mated, usually there's about a week. Some people have the uh, uh, great fortune of seeing a queen come back after she's mated and she has mating sign on her. I, I've never seen that myself, but uh, um, that's that's uh, some fun stuff to kind of look for when you think your queen's coming going out on mating flights. Um, she does uh, recent research. I know this comes up as a question oftentimes. Um, uh, how many drones does the queen mate with? Uh, there's a lot of literature from the last 20 years that would say 12 to 14. But every time they do more research, and it's not easy to research how many queens, you know, this, uh, it's hard to control, but with, with the more genetic analysis we do, we're finding that she may mate with as many as 75 uh, drones. And that uh, that number of 12 to 14 is actually pretty small. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll keep watching for that and hoping that somebody does some good research to figure that out. All right. Um, so the virgin uh, versus a mated queen, what's the difference? What do you see? Um, when you have a virgin on a frame, uh, she moves quickly. We're gonna, I've got a little video I'll show you in a, in a minute that might help with that. Um, but she moves erratically, she's slender, she definitely flies. If you, if you have a virgin queen on a frame, don't try to mark her, because if you don't catch her, oftentimes she'll fly and, and usually she does not come back. So um, that's just been my experience. Um, so be careful with, with a, if you think you have a virgin queen. She doesn't generally have a retinue around her. So the, the, uh, the bees that would feed her, take care of her, uh, always be trying to get her pheromone on them and, and to transfer that um, to the other bees. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't see that. Um, once she's mated, she moves slowly. Looks to, The way I describe it is it looks like a, a snow plow. She, there's bees all over the frame. She just plows right through them and keeps moving. And occasionally she'll stop and a bunch of bees will surround her and she'll get fed and groomed and Sometimes she'll just sit there quietly while they, they take care of her. Uh, but uh, generally it's a slow, predictable movement uh, and she doesn't want to fly. So it's usually, although she does, she will run away from you if you try to pick her up. Uh, once, you, uh, once you get her, she's usually uh, does not want to fly. She just wants to get back in the hive. I've had queens that uh, did fly when I was trying to pick them up. And usually they do a couple circles around the hive and go right back in the entrance or on the top. So uh, be aware of that. So here's a queen being born. Just watch for a minute. Don't forget if you have questions, put them in the chat so that we can, we can cover them at the break. You notice the little cap here as the um, the queen has chewed that off. And uh, that is generally something you see in, in queen cells as they're just getting ready. The, the bees will chew off to help the queen emerge. They will chew the wax off the tip. So this one is not quite ready. It's still got the wax down here, but this one, they have chewed the wax off the outside. They know she's in there, she's ready to go. And uh, ultimately, let's watch her. She's coming up. There you go. So her cuticle is still soft, as I said, and, and it'll be. It'll take a you know few minutes for it to dry and, and become hard. Um, yeah, all right. So there's. That. So here's a a queen uh, on a frame, and you can tell what I was saying before. You can tell she's a virgin. I mean, she is moving. She's all over trying to get away uh, just from the light and get away from, you know, the beekeeper here. Um, she's, she just trucking along. 
uh, a, a, here's a marked queen in here on this frame, but yeah, you really you really can see that she's she's moving pretty quick. Um, here's a bee with a queen sign. That's just the the parts from the last drone that are still inside her. Uh, the bees will will uh, remove that and uh, clean her up. And uh, uh, but that's a sign that she is now mated and ready to go. It's my understanding that a queen will go on two or three different flights uh, to mate. So uh, it's not just a one-time thing in general. And of course, it depends a lot on the weather. I've had queens this year, especially, that didn't mate properly because of uh, just during that period, during the, the, the time when she should be mating, uh, it was just, the weather was too bad. So it happens. So what happens during mating? Um, on the right here, you can see a pretty simple illustration of how the mating works. Uh, the queen flies through, there's a thing called a drone collection area. So um, what happens is uh, when the queen leaves the hive uh, to go mate, she will go one way and the drones will go another way. Typically the, the way I understand it, and the things I've I've read, uh, this is not something you see very often. So a lot of this is just what you get out of literature, but uh, the drones will collect in a drone collection area. And it looks like a swarm. It's about, about 70 to 150 feet in the air. They're just flying around and they will generally collect in the same area every year. And then the queens go out and they look for these drone collection areas. So the, the idea is that the drones will go one direction out of a hive and then the queen will go the other direction. Generally, they don't wanna go in the same direction because they don't want, the queen does not wanna mate with her offspring. Um, so uh, that produces genetically, um, you know, uh, that, that doesn't work. The, 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 the you know, eggs that are laid, uh, fertilized with her own uh, drone, um, sperm will fail. So uh, basically she's gonna go, the, the drones are big, have trouble flying. They go maybe a half mile to a mile in, in one direction. The queen can go two to three or four miles in another direction so that she's mating with a whole new set of um, drones, somebody outside of her um, genetic line. So each drone produces about 5 million sperm or one microliter. Her spermatheca holds about one microliter. So if you think about it, what's happening here is the drone is mating, he's injecting his sperm, and then he's, uh, the, the next bee that comes up behind will yank this out and, and, and mate. And so what you have is not, all of the sperm is going in. She's got a large area in her abdomen that just stores bulk fluid in there. And, uh, um, and, and it's mixing in there. So as this process is going on and she's mating with, she, she obviously can't carry 70 microliters if she's mating with 70 drones. So this stuff is kind of coming out and, and, uh, and, and mixing around in her abdomen. And then finally, after, uh, she's done mating, uh, it gets expressed into the um, uh, spermatheca as a mixture. And that gets, um, that, that once her spermatheca is filled, that's what she uses for the rest of her, uh, her life to, to uh, fertilize eggs. Um, the, the only other comment I'll have on this is one of the things that that makes um, Africanized bees so effective is that they're so aggressive and, and they preferentially mate with queens. So if you have drones, and, and this is something to think about, when you have a, a defensive hive, you're not just producing bees that are defensive, you're producing drones that are defensive. And if they preferentially mate with queens, you're producing more queens that are defensive. So if you have a defensive hive, it needs to be requeened. And if at all possible, you need to cull the, the drones from there uh, regularly so that they don't go and, and uh, produce more defensive bees. 
Okay. So mating, after mating, uh, queen activates her ovaries, initiates egg laying, and she can lay up to 1,500 eggs a day. Uh, obviously, that's seasonal. She's not going to lay 1,500 day, eggs in, in November. That won't work. Um, and it depends. I say that, but maybe in, maybe in San Diego, they can, they can do that. Um, no, uh, she's no longer phototactic. That means she won't fly unless the colony swarms. She doesn't want to be out in the light. And you can you can see that regularly. If you find a queen, she always wants to be on the dark side of the frame. Um, she'll move till she's she's in the darkest possible spot. Uh, her phone, her, her, her pheromone profile changes dramatically, and now she becomes the master of the hive. So uh, her her mandibular pheromone shifts. Uh, she starts to get a retinue. Uh, she's got her tarsal glands uh, start going. She's walking around. She's leaving her mark everywhere in the hive to show that she is the master. And at that point, if you have another queen in there or a virgin or something, they will ball her. The other bees will ball her and, and they will kick her out. So if you've got two virgins in a hive because of swarming, uh, generally they don't, they don't fight that much. And that's why you see multiple swarms uh, coming out with virgins. Um, after the after the mated queen is gone, there's less of that uh, pheromone in there to, to control the hive. Um, so this is a spermatheca, basically that's completely clear. Um, you have uh, a full one, and you have uh, another full one. I'm not sure why we have two pictures of that, but basically this probably is just not as as uh, um, not well mated. So when it's really full, it looks like this. Um, so the queen, when when if she's not mated well, um, she runs out of sperm faster, and you start to see frames with bees. Uh, she'll be laying eggs in the frames that are both um, fertilized and, and unfertilized, and you'll start to see drone uh, drones in amongst the regular worker bees. Um, rather than segregated to a separate part of the, of the beehive. Um, and of course, if she's not mated well, that means that she's not gonna get, the, the hive is not gonna get the genetic diversity. If you have, uh, some bees have a propensity to produce uh, uh, propolis, some are better honey collectors, some are better pollen collectors, some are better at dancing, you know, whatever the, the particular thing is, that if you get a real wide variation in, in uh, genetics, you're gonna get the best chance of survival. So this is really a, uh, um, you know, a survival mechanism for the honeybees and why they've been so successful and, and been around for so long. Um, and of course, the other part of this is if the queen doesn't mate well, she doesn't produce uh, as much pheromone uh, to control a hive and is more likely to be superseded at some point. So um, you really, uh, uh, the, the mating is an important part of the, the process. Okay, well, what leads to it? Well, things you can, uh, can't control generally, uh, poor mating conditions and bad weather. Boy, that's, that's what has happened this year. And that's why a lot of our uh, package producers are behind. They, they need to be able to get their queens to mate properly. Uh, things that can be controlled, uh, the, the quality of the queens, quality of the drones, uh, poor rearing conditions. If you, if you are rearing your own queens, you know how you do that, how you uh, make sure that you're grafting from the proper age larva. Uh, you got to pick a, a very, very young larva. One, one day old is the best, uh, two day old maybe, but by three days, you're starting to probably get some uh, changes in the diet and that's going to change uh, the profile of your queen if she hasn't been fed royal jelly the whole time. So uh, how you, there are things that you can control um, uh, and, and uh, should be thinking about. Um, Queen production is not linked to drone production. So uh, you, you know, if, the, if the queen is uh, out of sperm, she can still uh, produce drones. 
hopelessly queenless colonies. Um, I'm getting towards the end and towards the end of the, the first break. So I'll get through this quick and we'll, we'll get to a break and we can do some questions. Hopelessly queenless, uh, basically after the queen has been gone for a while, there's no eggs there for the, the, the bees to build a new or to make a new queen. Uh, workers can become pregnant and uh, or pregnant and can develop their ovaries and, and lay eggs. So uh, when you see that, you see it like this. The only thing I would caution on this is when you have a new queen this time of year, oftentimes the first eggs that she lays might be two or sometimes three in a cell. She hasn't quite got her, her egg laying you know, uh, concept down. Be careful that you don't think that, you know, just because you have a couple of cells that have uh, multiple eggs in them that you may still have a very viable queen in there. It's just early in her egg laying process. Um, and then of course we talk about uh, communication via chemicals and, and what's going on with pheromones, the queen, the alarm, the brood, the nasinov. There's a lot of pheromones going on in a hive and that's how they control things. Um, colony recognition, each colony has its own smell. Workers use it to identify non-colony mates. The smell is acquired usually um, after the first 24 hours. Um, and new, newly emerged bees can be placed into any colony. So nurse bees, basically, uh, when you have a frame with nurse bees on it, they are very flexible in terms of how they can be moved. And that's why you generally make uh, packages with, uh, with a lot of nurse bees in there. They're easy to move around. Alarm pheromone. Uh, when, when a bee stings, uh, it, uh, it, it gives off a pheromone. There's a couple of different pheromones in the uh, back of the bee. I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, there is a brood pheromone. Uh, that communicates the age of the brood, how, how they need to be fed and when they need to be st stopped being fed. And uh, the last stage, I think at the fifth instar, the, the, uh, the, the uh, bees um, internal um, piping completes, the intestine is connected to the anus, the bee poops, and they start to immediately close it up and, uh, and cap the cell. So very much a positive feedback loop. The, the bees produce pheromones to make things happen and the, and the brood produces pheromones to make things happen and it feeds back, you know, each one feeds back to the other. Um, again, uh, there's actually tarsal glands on the, on the feet of the queen as she's walking around. Um, she has a, uh, a track that she leaves and that uh, determines um, you know, that just lets everybody know that she's there and uh, um, that she's in charge. There's a dufour gland uh, behind the stinger that produces the banana smelling um, pheromone that uh, the, the alarm pheromone. Um, and I think that's time for questions. Thanks, Pete. It's a very informative and clear first section of the class. Um, so we'll go into the break. And so this break, the first section is going to be questions. And then Pete, just let me know when you're ready to transition to actual break. And so during this time, if you don't want to listen to the question and answers, you can get up and relax. Um, and we'll come back at 10, 13 and restart the presentation then. Let's jump into the questions. Pete, I'll just read them out to you if that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So we have, uh, let's see, I think six questions in the chat. So first one was asked when you're giving your introduction, do you run your 20 to 25 hives by yourself? How many hours per week do you spend managing the hives? How often do you inspect them? Mm, great question. So yes, I run them all by myself. Um, and I've got, uh, uh, you know, several people I, I, um, contract uh, to uh, take care of their hives. So I, I would include that in, in my 25. Um, it, gets, it gets difficult because I'm kind of at that point where it's, um, it's 
dicey to take care of everything. Uh, the ones I take care of for other people, uh, I tend to take care of better than the ones I do for myself. Um, and I would just say uh, what I have learned uh, two main things about managing hives. The more you get, the less time you have to sit and think about, oh, that's neat. Look at this. You know, there's a, a, a bee doing this or that. So what <laughs> what I've done, and this really, uh, to be honest, the, the journey level uh, at the Master Beekeeper program kind of forced me to learn to do a, a hive check quickly. And I think if you looked at what most professional beekeepers do, you're not in there looking for uh, a lot of uh, a lot of different stuff. It's you know, do you have disease? Do you have a, are you queen right? And can you um, do you need to make some shift in that hive? So I can go in and five minutes into a hive, lift boxes, check for weight, look for you know frames, and then move on to the next one. If it looks like it's got an issue, uh, you know, in 20 hives, I might check two or three of them for mites and then boom, just move on to the next one. So it, it, you get to be in more production mode when you have more hives. And if you have a thousand hives, you're definitely in that. In one or two, I just sat, I would sit and look for, for half an hour on the hive. <laughs> That's really neat. <laughs> you know, go ahead. Next question. How do they test how many drones a queen mates with? Boy, that's a that's a great question. I, the, with all the technology now, with uh, there you have like fake drones uh, that I mean, literally, the, the terminology here gets real messy because the mechanical drones that we make can go up and and video some of this stuff. And there's some really neat videos that show some of the mating and and various things. I think what they do to, to tell how many drones is genetic testing though. So where you can't really watch the mating. You can come back and say, okay, I can see these genetic markers that show that it must have been 70 different drones. That's, that's my understanding, but I'm no expert on that. So. so you hear a lot about the effects of Varroa on the health of the worker bees. What about the queen? Yeah, great question. Um, in general, the, the queen, uh, because she's groomed constantly, I don't believe she has, I've, I've never heard of anybody saying that they have a problem with Varroa on the queen. However, uh, the impact that, that really affects her is the, is the virus load in the colony and the, um, and the ability of the colony to, um, and we're, we'll talk about this here in a little bit, but uh, the ability of the colony to really uh, support her because as they as they get sicker and there are fewer and fewer bees in the colony, um, they just can't take care of her anymore. But I think it's a grooming issue. She gets groomed all the time. And and I I've never because she's uh, that's the other thing because she's only sixteen days from egg to larva, the the mites do not prefer to go into a queen cell to actually uh, they want drones because they can make an extra mite. In this, you have to learn the life cycle of a, of a mite, but basically they can make two mites for every one that goes in, they make two uh, coming out. And if they are in the drones, they can make three to four just because of the length of time. So uh, the survival rate of the mites in drones goes way up and queens, it's just too short. They, they, they can't reproduce in, in a queen cell. Uh, on his on your timeline, it states that eggs at three, the eggs at three. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip that question for a second. Uh, if I remove a defensive queen, should I reintroduce the new queen cage immediately? Is it more difficult to get a large defensive hive to accept a new queen? We're gonna talk about that a little bit later too, but I I would say. Uh, you want to you want to have a break between the old queen and the new queen because the old queen is going to have real strong pheromone in there. You put a new queen in, even in a cage, uh, sometimes they can find a way to to kill her or seal her in or do something to to uh, you know make it not work. Uh, and and really defensive hives, certainly Africanized ones. There's oftentimes you can't requeen. They just won't. They won't take a new queen. She just isn't strong enough. So sometimes you're just faced with you know, that, that hive won't do it. But uh, the best thing, if you're gonna, um, 
requeen a defensive hive is to call the old queen, wait a couple days. Uh, you can even put a, a, a fake pheromone a stick, there, uh, Man Lake sells them, you can put them in there uh, just to hold them for a little while, then pull the stick, wait a, a couple more days, and, uh, and then put your queen in. Uh, preferably a mated queen, you don't want to put a virgin in uh, to a defensive hive. Yeah, go ahead. Is it true that EHB or European honeybee sperm is not prioritized when a queen fertilizes an egg, but Africanized honeybee sperm is? Okay, repeat that. Uh, is it true that European honeybee sperm is prioritized when a queen fertilizes an egg? Oh, yeah, that's above my pay grade. I, I, I don't know that. I can ask um, our director, Alina Nino, which is the director of the camp, and I could put that in. I think for that the would camp. be a, that would be a great question for her. Yeah, good question. I I'd like to know it too, but I I uh, I just don't have that that information. So, and then the question: Could you go back to the timeline uh, that you had for the developmental periods? I believe there's a question on that. And I think if you have it up, it would be easier. Um, yeah, and then we should go to break. The real break. Okay. Sounds good. That one. Yeah, um, so it says the egg is at three. Why not zero to three? Or is it is it zero? Yeah, to three? I mean, basically, the the egg is uh, they they're an egg for three days. That's that's just if you put <laughs> um, length of time. You're saying right? And then yeah, you, you stack three days as an time. egg. Yeah, it's a length of time. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, uh, yeah, that's great to to can clarify that. Yeah, but length of time. So these are additive. If you add these up, it comes to sixteen. If you add these up, it comes to twenty one. If you add these up, it comes to twenty four. So that's okay. The point. Uh, yeah, we that took. Uh, I guess time flies, huh? So we'll extend the break. How much longer do you want, Pete? Like five minutes? Yeah, if we could, let's go another five minutes, and then we'll come back. Um, and get into splitting and combining hives, a little more practical stuff. Sounds good, 1016, see everyone back here.
Okay, good to go. All set. Want to go one more question? Just to well, sure, yeah. Happened. One more came in, so that's perfect. You stated the queen will avoid mating with her own brood, but a single colony in an urban neighborhood, how does she not mate with her own brood? <laughs> um, good question. And uh, the, the amazing thing about bees is that uh, they they, um, they find a way. I, there are hives in places you'd never expect, and um, they. Um, my my expectation would be you have two choices: either that queen is mating with another hive that's somewhere in the vicinity, or they're going to die. So it's not like um, you know there, there's much of a choice there. Yeah, the the. Uh, Queen mates with her own drone, those uh, sperm are not viable. That will not, they will not work. The bees will identify those. Um, my understanding is they will identify the, um, the larva and pull them out. <laughs> They'll reject them. Don't have the right pheromone profile or something. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a good way to segue back in here. I, and we are still recording, right, Keanu? Yes. Okay. Um, the, uh, the, the, what I'm saying in these, in this presentation is, um, my opinion a lot, you know, there's some of this is just based on the science and the slides are pretty straightforward, but when I'm talking about experience, you know, it's my personal experience. So, uh, some of you may have different experiences and absolutely may be just as valid as what I'm saying or, or more. Um, so I, I just put that in as a caveat. And uh, here's where, in the next couple of slides here, this is where it starts to get into some of my experience and, and the things that I see. So we're gonna talk a little bit here about splitting and combining hives. Um, I wanna emphasize that uh, safety is important when you're in your hives. Um, some of you may not be at a level where you've been in a hive very much, so I want to make sure you kind of think about a couple of things. Um, you can develop an allergy. As I said at the beginning, uh, my, I, I learned from my cousin and with my dad, and uh, he was a beekeeper for 15 years and then suddenly just developed an allergy and had to quit. So you want to be aware that you can develop an allergy. Um, in general, it's not a good idea to wear perfume. Many perfumes have as part of their um, you know, smell profile, a banana type smell that works like the Amer alarm pheromone. If you've ever been around a hive with aftershave or perfume on and it has the alarm pheromone on it, it's pretty impressive how the bees just go after you. Um, so be aware. Long pants, closed-toed shoes, light-colored clothing, um, uh, all helps to keep the bees uh, calmer and just more gentle. Um, use your veil, but uh, when you're lighting your smoker, make sure you pull your veil back. You don't want to burn a hole in the veil, and you don't want to melt the plastic to your face or anything like that. So be careful when you're lighting your smoker. Be calm. Go through the hive slowly. Sort of a Zen thing. Take it slow, watch as you come out, and then uh, be, get in and get out as much as possible. So you're not, the longer you're in the hive, the more defensive the bees will get as a general rule. All right, so why do you want to split? What do you want to do that, uh, why, why would you ever want to split a hive? Well, you want to, uh, there's a number of reasons. You may want to grow your operation. You may want to have, uh, go from five hives to, uh, 150 hives. Um, I'd, uh, we have a guy that was in our, our association who's a professional beekeeper, and he had a poisoning event, lost, I think, 125 hives in one location because somebody sprayed, and all of the bees, he went out there one day and they were all dead. And he was back up to production in, I want to say, Three months, he was right back up to 150 hives. He's really good at it. Um, so you can, if you need to, you can get up. You know, 
you know, want to share good genetics, uh, you may want to split to, to uh, increase the uh, uh, gentleness of your bees. If you've got a defensive hive, uh, you may want to you know, want to split your good hive and, and replace your, your uh, defensive hive. Uh, for varroa control, there's some really good options uh, in, in your IPM tactics for, uh, for controlling varroa. Um, you may want to keep smaller colonies, so you split just to uh, give it away or uh, keep your colony small. Um, you may not want a lot of honey production, so keeping your colony small will do that, help with that. And then, of course, you may want to sell nukes, and that's, uh, that's an option, too. So just to give you an idea, I give you one right away, but uh, this is from the uh, Elaine and Nino. She was uh, in 2015 had 16 colonies for, for on the almonds and uh, 35 packages and in, in March. And in June, she had 85 colonies, two deep colonies. So you can see you can you can split and increase your production dramatically, uh, beef production that is. Uh, March 12th, uh, colonies from almonds and 20 packages. June, she had 60 colonies. So, um, you know, you can you can grow your apiary pretty darn fast if you want to uh, do it using splits. There's different kinds of splits. Um, there's walkaway splits, splits where you put uh, queen cells in and, and let the virgins come out and get mated. S uh, split where you put a virgin queen in that's already hatched or you can make a split with a mated queen. So, uh, um, yeah, those are simple splits. Um, there's something called a walkaway split. I use this pretty frequently because I'm a small time beekeeper. I don't need to uh, do anything too complicated and I'm not trying to get, you know, that much bigger. So I'm, I'm using, uh, when I lose a hive in the winter, I, find my one of my better hives and I just do a walkway split where you uh, when the hive is healthy and really going strong in the in the spring um, I'll take the upper box off and I move it to a new location and the uh, the queenless half will requeen itself in my area I can do that in Southern California or San Diego especially you have to add a queen that's not that's not allowed um, you're more likely to get an Africanized hive that way um, so when do you, uh, when do you split? It should be done in, uh, during the swarm season and the time of high forage ability, uh, forage availability. So generally speaking, right now is a good time to be thinking about making splits. Um, you do have the potential for a requeen failure, failure. It does happen occasionally. And, and if that, you need to watch, you need to, this is where you go back to your timeline. If you make a split like that, a, simple split and you go back in in a week, well, you know by your calendar, you're gonna have a uh, queen cells in there that they have made. So when you start pulling frames apart, you're likely to be damaging those queen cells. You probably wanna wait a little bit longer until the queens are hatched. And then you go in and look for either a virgin queen or a, a, um, um, or a mated queen. And uh, what I will say is at that point, if you don't have a queen or something's wrong, you will know it because there won't be any eggs, but you may have some uh, capped brood and you're probably gonna have to put another frame in and start a new, uh, start a, uh, the bees on a, a new path towards making a new queen. But uh, we can talk about that more later. Uh, you do reduce production when you when you do a walkaway split. You're you're cutting your hive at least in half, and and or, you know you you basically are lowering the amount of bees in the hive and and setting them back. So your production of honey will be lower. Uh, of course, it's a great way to handle varroa uh, because basically you have a brood break, and when you have a brood break, uh, the varroa can't um, Reproduce in the in the uh, larval cells or in the uh, uh, the pupil cells, so works out really well for controlling larva. Uh, gosh, for controlling varroa, and of course it's easy. A walkaway split's real easy. Uh, splits with cells. You split a colony in two equal halves. Place cells from the graft uh, producer frame with cells started in the queenless split. 
So basically, uh, you make your your queenless split. You uh, um, you raise cells and then you distribute them to the other um, other hives, or other splits you make. You do have a potential queen requeen failure again, uh, lower production but higher than walk away uh, because you've actually put a, a virgin queen in that will hatch quickly and and move right back towards uh, full production uh, very quickly. So uh, you may lower varroa levels, but uh, it's not gonna be as long of a brood break. And so you're not gonna have uh, that significant of a change. Uh, and of course it requires that you find the queen uh, and, and isolate her in one box. All right, so um, split with a virgin queen. So now you've got a virgin queen, she's hatched. Um, you take her and you actually put her in. Now you've got, again, some potential for a requeen failure, not, not as much, uh, but of course, if she, if she uh, flies and dies uh, on her mating flight, you, uh, you, you can lose her. Lower production, but higher than walk away. So now you've got uh, you know, a virgin queen in there. She's gonna be mated in uh, just a few days and, uh, and be ready to lay in five to, 10 days. And so you really are, um, uh, you know, redu your, your reduction in production is low, the, the least uh, at this point. So, uh, and of course you gotta find the queen. Okay, split with a mated queen. Now this one is gonna be the, um, the quickest uh, changeover. You just make your split and you, I, I leave it queenless for a couple of days. Um, because you want to get her smell out of there. Now that that is uh, can be dangerous um, because you you want to make sure that when you go back in that the, the bees are not starting to make an emergency queen. So you need to cull all the cells that are in there that could possibly be a uh, emergency uh, queens. Um, but if you put your your uh, your new uh, made a queen in that hive and you uh, install her properly. We'll talk about this in a minute. Um, you have the minimal potential for requeen failure and almost no drop off in production. Uh, your, your varroa levels probably will not have any effect on the varroa levels. Um, it can be done any time of the season, uh, any time of the year, any season. Um, if you have to do, like you say you wanna make a split, but you wanna wait a while, they do have these uh, pheromone, queen pheromone sticks. And uh, basically you just hang one of these in the hive and that will make the bees think there's a queen in there and keep them from producing um, uh, emergency cells. So that's an option. I just threw that in uh, to sort of something to think about. Um, so uh, yeah, we can talk about this uh, in the Q&A part if you want. Um, what does it look like? Uh, well, it would be really nice if we were able to do this at the uh, UC Davis apiary, but uh, so I've made some pictures here that we could, we could talk about. Um, a simple split, you basically just break the boxes uh, put the queen in one box and then this uh, other box, they'll make a new queen. Uh, very simple. You, know, you can't do it in parts of California where bees are prone to mate with Africanized drones. Uh, you, uh, you always have a chance of, of the bees becoming more defensive if they're mating with, uh, with, with uh, defensive bees. But um, just, you know, in general, we have, uh, and at least in my area, we've had a good experience doing it this way, simple split. Um, yeah, so this, this is a wrong, it's from the last slide, but basically what you do if you uh, are in San Diego or some of those areas, you just buy a new queen from an approved uh, vendor and you install her when you make the split, uh, give it a couple days, as I said before, before you uh, release her in there. Um, and then there's different options with, you can add boxes depending on the, the, how, how well your hive is doing and is it thriving. Uh, you, can, um, you can add boxes as you're making your splits uh, to give the bees more room. 
uh, you can move resources around inside the box to make it um, checkerboard it so that you have uh, more room for the queen to lay eggs. Uh, that's going to get the quickest response. And you don't want to get take a chance. Oftentimes, if you're close to being um, uh, close to being in swarming mode because of um, just it's it's the right time of year, you need to be careful that you you not only uh, move the queen and the and the box to a new uh, area, but you but you uh, checkerboard the, the uh, brood chamber so that uh, she has plenty of room to lay in there and, and it won't, won't continue to try to go down the path of, of swarming. Um, although it doesn't show it here, the other thing you can do on this um, to avoid swarming is to swap these boxes. Oftentimes in the, in the um, February, March timeframe as the, in our area, as the bees warm up, we'll see that the whole uh, cluster will move into the upper box and leave the bottom box uh, mostly empty. And so what, what, uh, what I've found works really well um, is to swap these boxes uh, and, and give them, that gives the queen more room to lay and uh, disrupts the hive enough that uh, swarming tendency goes down. But once you get through that period and into, into April, they're generally speaking, they're in full on swarm mode. You need to make splits and checkerboard and, and do that. So, um, you can make, uh, you know, if, if it's really strong hive, you just keep adding boxes as you're making splits. Uh, when, when to add a box, I generally add a box when I've got eight frames of bees. So uh, this can be taken to the nth degree. You can, you can, um, you know, you can make splits where you've got a really strong hive right now. You make, you take it out and and make, you know, three splits. You can make five splits out of it. I've seen people make, you know, five to seven splits out of one hive because it's so strong. Of course, you're really setting your production back, but you're you're increasing your apiary dramatically when you do that. So it's an easy way to get back up and uh, to, to full, uh, full speed. Uh, yeah, and then as I said, Southern California, you don't wanna be making new queens. You wanna, you wanna be adding a, a viable uh, queen from a approved queen reader. All right, um, just different options. Um, how you move uh, things around just depends on how many hives you want to have and where you want to put them. New queens, you could add one, add two. Um, you can make lots of splits. Like I said, if you've got if you've got access to new queens, you can you can get up to speed real fast. And this is what the professionals do. They uh, they take uh, in the early part of the year they'll they'll have uh, new queens, uh, bring them in and just make all these splits with new queens. And then uh, that's what uh, they, they get them charged up and ready to go. And once you have a certain number of frames of bees uh, and they're all viable, you can take them out and put them on pallets and take them to the almonds in, uh, in the valley. So um, things to consider when you're splitting. Uh, time of year, uh, certainly how much it costs. The queens aren't free uh, anywhere from Forty to one hundred fifty dollars, depending on the breed of the queen. I don't know what the what the maximum price is for queens, but I, there's some pretty specialized ones. And uh, but I think typically it runs in the forty to sixty dollar range for a new queen. Um, location uh, and region where you are. So you really got to be careful. Like I said over and over and over again, if you're in an area where you have defensive or Africanized bees, you want to be aware that. Uh, you have restrictions on what you can do. And that's the laws apply there. Um, and of course, honey production. If you're, you gotta always go back to your goals because um, if you, if your goal is honey production, uh, you may not want to do splits too early because um, you want that hive to produce a lot of honey 
then you want it, especially for us, early in the spring, you want your hives really strong. You don't want to take that strong hive and split it right at the point where uh, they should be pulling in uh, orange blossom honey or something like that. So you, you need to be aware that uh, the splitting can reduce uh, production on uh, if that's your goal. Uh, there's a catch-22 to splitting. Uh, um, don't allow colonies to swarm. Equipment is expensive. Um, hive density is an issue. Uh, splitting is, uh, is free bees. Your, your uh, area may not allow for many colonies. And uh, you, know, you may not be allowed to have as many colonies as you're getting when you're making these splits. So be aware of that. Smaller colonies can be more docile. So the bigger the colony gets, uh, the more, more defensive it's likely to be. Um, so, uh, when you're installing a queen, you want to make sure that you go through and, and don't depend on the queen to go and, and, uh, and, and knock down cells. You have, to, you have to be proactive and go through and destroy any queen cells. So, if we're, we're installing, we want to make sure we're, we're thinking this through. Don't want any competition, right, for our new queen. When you do install, um, sugar water is a great way to uh, make sure that the queen is accepted. Uh, you're going to give her a couple of days with with a um, in, in whatever queen cage you use. You want to give her a couple of days to uh, acclimate to the hive and get the bees used to her uh, to make sure that you're successful. Um, some of the professional beekeepers do this fairly quickly. Uh, if you're a new beekeeper, I suggest you take your time and, and make sure that you don't lose your queen uh, because you've let her go too early. Um, so here, this, this uh, queen cage, you can see the queen inside. Uh, you can see the, that they've used grass uh, to plug the, the hole. The bees will chew right through that and get her out. You can, uh, some of the queen cages, the wood ones, we'll, I'll show you in a second. Uh, they have uh, queen candy in them. Um, I've had success with all these methods. So I, I, if you have questions about that, we can talk about it. But oftentimes when the queen is accepted, uh, the biggest problem I've encountered is the candy's too hard and they can't get her out. And I've even had queens die because uh, they, they, if I don't get back to that hive in a week and she doesn't get fed, she's not gonna make it. So. Um, just be aware that uh, you, you want to make sure that you go back in and check if you're putting a new queen in. Um, I'm just reading my notes here, see if there's anything else. Yeah, you just want to make sure that the queen can be fed by the nurse bees. That's why it has all these holes in it. And that's why this is kind of a nice cage for the queen. Is It's got holes that can be accessed from any side of the of the container. So um, they recommend, this is a uh, El Nino uh, bee lab expert uh, professional who's installing this and I'll show you his, his way of doing it here in a second and he, <laughs> he uses a lot of sugar water. Um, I'm, I'm always nervous about drowning the, the, the queen and so I, I don't do quite as as much as this guy does. I tend to um, use just enough uh, to, to uh, you know, make sure that the bees are happy. And, and if there's a feeder on, that, that usually takes care of it. But the bees are really good about feeding the queen. Uh, it's been my experience. I, I've banked a bunch of bee queens in, in the top of a hive, right on top of the inner cover with a little spacer. And it's amazing how the bees will come out of that little hole in the inner cover and just take care of the queens for weeks. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, we'll just keep moving along here. And uh, so, the, you know, their, their concept here is spray the workers with sugar, spray the queen with sugar, make everybody happy, and they're more likely to accept her. You install her between two frames, and I've, I've uh, got, several different styles of queen cage. The biggest problem I've had with this is uh, if you see this is a older frame with a lot of wax and, a, and comb built out 
in the space on either side, this is not likely to fall through. If you're working with a new queen and new bees and you put this between two frames and there's not all this kind of sticky material and, and uh, places to hold up the, this um, queen cage, it can fall through. And if it can, my, my thing is if it can fall through in my hives, it will fall through. So you need to be aware, um, maybe stick a toothpick through here just to make it, give a bridge across the two frames, whatever you need to do, just make sure that you, uh, you don't drop it to the bottom because in this cold weather we have this time of year in the mornings, uh, you, can, uh, you can kill a queen doing that That'll, if she drops to the bottom. She just gets cold and dies. Okay, so here's a video of their professional beekeeper installing his queen. And you see, he's got a standard California wooden cage here. It doesn't have any attendance. It's got a spot for candy in this little black thing, but he's not gonna worry about that. He's gonna pull the top of the cage off. Now he's got the queen in his hand and he is gonna move her, oh, he's gonna mark her first. So he puts her down, holds her down and puts his little mark on her. Now this is not something that I do, um, I, but this is the way he does it. So. It just gives you an idea. Taps her down to get her away from the entrance. And then he's using, which I think this is really interesting, a piece of tissue paper. Looks like kind of lens cleaning paper, very, very uh, light. And then he's going to wet it with sugar. So the bees chew that stuff up in no time. They'll, they'll get her out of there. Um, but he just soaks her with <laughs> sugar. I can't do that. Um, and then he drops her in that spot and boom. He's done. So um, yeah, I I uh, I just love to watch how different people do these things in different ways. It's it's really fascinating to see how beekeepers uh, do do their job in different ways. We can talk about that more too if if you have questions. So uh, there's also combining colonies uh, when when. Uh, you get to a situation, oftentimes at the end of the year, especially in the fall, where you need to be able to combine colonies. Um, you, you uh, basically what you're looking at is I've got a weak hive and I've got a strong hive, and the weak hive just is not looking like it's going to make it. As you get more experience, you'll kind of look at it and think that's that queen's not doing that well. She's getting a little older. Maybe she's marked for last year. You got a mark on her, and she's, uh, you know from a year ago, say, I, I'm going to try to merge this colony with another colony, and then they'll be stronger for overwintering. Well, um, you can, you know, you can kind of save that colony by doing that. Um, you may have a hive that's lost a queen, and you're looking at it, and you're saying, you know, rather than um, uh, try to get a new queen, I'm just going to combine this with another hive. Uh, you may uh, have an issue with robbing and you want to uh, prevent robbing, so you, uh, you want to combine a hive to, to get away from that. Um, because it, it, you know, maybe it's partially been robbed out. Um, and you want to get less hives. Sometimes you just say, look, I've got five hives, I only want two. I'm going to combine some hives and, and, and uh, reduce the size of my apiary. Um, you only want to combine colonies that have one queen. So you're going to have to get rid of one queen. Uh, that's just the, the best way to handle it um, if you're going to actually merge the two colonies. They won't accept both queens. And if you don't get a swarm uh, immediately, you'll probably get uh, a lot of fighting and a lot of dead bees. Um, the uh, the, the, you may end up with a completely queenless colony too, because the bees from one hive, if you just merge them together without any delay or any barrier, uh, and there's two queens, the bees from each colony will try to ball the other queen up and cook her and, and uh, kill her. Um, the queenless colony should be the weaker one if possible. So if you've got a weak hive, make sure you kill the weak queen, not the strong queen. Um, and, and from your hive you're combining. Uh, use newspaper to separate the two supers. And you can cut slits in the paper to allow for faster combination, but 
I've found um, it doesn't matter. They 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 chew right through it in no time at all. And uh, I like the slower method of moving the bees together. It's just the way I do it. But you know, different people have different experiences. It looks like this. You've got a weak hive, you got a strong hive, you keep the strong queen, you get rid of, and I say get rid of, uh, basically what I do is I would take that queen out and I would put her into my alcohol spray bottle with the um, uh, queen lure for, for swarm lures. So that pheromone is, is actually that she's carrying um, get, is good for attracting uh, bees to a, a swarm lure. So um, what I do is when I'm killing queens, I just drop her in the alcohol, she's dead instantly and, uh, and still provides help for the rest of the, the you know, work that I'm doing to increase the apiary. I take the weak hive and I put it over the strong hive with a piece of newspaper in between. And really, really straightforward. I mean, the bees will just go back to work. You'll see them coming in and out the entrance. Um, I don't leave any, any uh, if there's a slot in the inner cover, I, I don't allow the bees to go in and out of there. I want them to chew a hole in the newspaper and come out. And what happens if you, if you uh, allow them to do it, They'll make a cut where they want to, and then they'll come through that hole one at a time, and they become kind of they'll they'll be a lot less likely to fight. And and within a week, you'll come out. Sometimes you'll see them flying out with big old chunks of newspaper. That's pretty funny too. I've seen bees come out with a a one inch diameter piece of newspaper and fly off with it. Uh, you'd never believe they could carry something that big and that not aerodynamic, it's, it's pretty comical to see them coming out and flying with a big piece of newspaper. But when you go in in a week, you, all you'll see is the rim around the outside where the, the, the wood's contacting the newspaper and the, the rim around the, uh, that's you know outside the hive. And they will completely chew through that newspaper and combine. So very cool, fun to watch. Um, immunity, we're gonna shift, shift uh, kind of, concepts here. We're going to start talking about disease. We're going to talk about IPM. Just to give you a little heads up, um, getting away from kind of the, the practical back into the, in, uh, into the uh, science of beekeeping. So um, honeybees are a host to many parasites and pathogens. So what we're, when we're managing our hives, we're looking for these things. We're trying to figure out um, Um, so what we're trying to um, do is look at the hive in a way that tells us quickly, oh, is there a disease? Is there a problem? You know, you walk up to your hive, you see this in the front, what's going on? Uh, I've got a better example of that here in a minute, but man, it's, uh, you know, this is probably as a beekeeper, one of the prime things we do uh, when we go into a hive is looking for parasites and pathogens. Okay, so uh, how, how do you deal with it? How, 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 the, how, how do the bees deal with uh, all these different things that are out in the world and, and what do they do? Well, there's uh, individual immunity, which is in, either innate or adaptive. And these terms, um, they're somewhat intuitive, but I wanna make sure that we kind of cover this so that everybody understands. There are immediate general defense uh, things that bees do uh, to fight um, pathogens and, and issues. So that's innate, immediate general defense against pathogens, intrinsic ability of the organism to defend itself against non-self uh, pathogens. So basically, you're, when you have an innate ability, it's just your immediate general defense, right? Adaptive is where you have specialized response, you're exposed to something, a uh, pathogen, and then you retain the ability to respond. Uh, you may not respond quickly at first, but when you, it hits you again, uh, you are able to adapt, and, and now you've adapted and you can respond more quickly the second time. So there's innate and adaptive, all right? 
There's social immunity, which is the ability of the entire hive to do something to actually uh, collectively fight some some invader or pathogen. Um, so that's uh, the collective uh, defenses. Things like hygienic behavior, uh, where the bees are like this, they're pulling a, a larva out and they're gonna get rid of it. There's something wrong with this. Oh, look, there's a mite right there. Um, so they're gonna pull that larva out. They're gonna get it out and, and take it away. Um, they have the ability, uh, each, a beehive, uh, excuse me, a bee is cold blooded. A beehive is warm blooded. So the hive uh, has the ability to keep the, maintain the um, temperature of the brood chamber at 95 degrees, uh, plus or minus one or two degrees. It's, I've got temperature gauges in my hives, uh, several of them, and I mean, it is rock solid when they're, this time of year, uh, they, the temperature can vary from 30 in the morning to 65 in the afternoon, and that temperature on the brood chamber never moves more than a degree. Um, it's amazing how they control the temperature. They also have the ability, because of the way that they create heat, to create a social fever. That means that they actually will ball up, and then you've heard me use that term several times now, they'll ball up a, an invader, a foreign queen, uh, yellow jackets, uh, various you know, other items, and they will actually surround it and they'll heat it up and, and they can um, uh, basically cook the, the uh, invader. Uh, by raising their temperature to 105 to 110 degrees and, uh, and, and kill that or kill that invader. Um, they have the ability to self-medicate, which is usually through uh, um, collecting um, uh, propolis and of course uh, self-removal. Uh, that, that's when you see the bees walking away from the hive. They, uh, they, they are sick, they fall on the ground and then they just walk away from the hive. So they will not stay near the hive. They will, um, you know, part of their, 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 that's called social immunity. They actually just say, I'm sick, I'm gonna leave and, and protect the rest of the hive. All right, um, so they, a little bit about the actual internal parts of a bee. Uh, they have an internal uh, or open circulatory system. There's a uh, dorsal vessel which is like a blood vessel that runs all the way down through the bee. And then they have hemolymph on the inside, which is the, their blood. But it, it, instead of being in blood vessels like we have it, it just circulates throughout the entire organism. So um, this, if you break a bee open, the hemolymph is just a general fluid that's inside the bee uh, moving around. And they have a heart, but it's just kind of a, a muscle here that pumps the blood through this uh, channel and then it, it circulates throughout the bee. Right. Um, pathogen invasion, okay. Uh, there's natural or created openings on an individual bee, whether it's the mouth, um, the anus, the spiracles on the side, there's different ways for bees to get, uh, have things enter their body. There's horizontal transmission, which is among individuals in the hive from one bee to another. Um, that's things like trophallaxis uh, through food, uh, fecal root. The bees are very good cleaners. So if you're squashing a lot of bees in your hive when you're closing the boxes, keep in mind that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, I, don't, I don't recommend you try to save every bee, but the more uh, guts that, that the bees have to clean up, means more chance for uh, the bees to pass viruses around. And then of course, there's sexually transmitted diseases that can be uh, passed through. Vertical is from mother to offspring. And um, you've got parasites like Varroa that can, can uh, bring in uh, uh, viruses. There's also uh, fomites. Uh, if you're in the master beekeeper class, this is a question. <laughs> what is a fomite? It's an object that can carry pathogens, uh, beekeeping equipment, hive tools, and protective equipment. So um, yeah, fancy word for keep your tools clean and your equipment clean, and you're less likely to pass um, 
viruses and, and pathogens from one hive to another. So how do you, uh, uh, how do bees modulate their immune response? Um, developmental stage in cast, lower level response in larval stages of both drones and workers and low response in drones and workers. Um, this is all work that's been done by people to study how bees manage uh, pathogens uh, and and how they um, how they are able to fight them at different stages. Uh, it makes a difference at what stage the bees in. If they're in the nurse area and they're passing around a lot of food from one to another, you know it's obviously going to make uh, a difference in how they. Uh, immune response is uh, how they handle the various pathogens that are in there. They're older and they're foraging, not so much. Um, parasite infestation, uh, varroa suppresses immune response and supports viral amplification. Really interesting work that's been done here around varroa and the symbiotic relationship with the uh, deformed wing virus. One of the first things you see when you have a Varroa problem, one of the first viruses that seems to uh, manifest is uh, um, deformed wing virus. And there's a, a relationship there between the virus and the, and the Varroa that su are support mutually supportive. The Varroa uh, are able to, um, suck the hemolymph out of the, out of the uh, and, and pass on the, the virus. The virus makes the uh, bee weaker. The weaker bee is easier for the varroa to uh, feed on. And so it's just a cycle uh, that allows the, the, uh, the virus allows the varroa to be more effective. So very, very cool. And the varroa makes the virus uh, uh, passes the virus on and, and gets support that way. So it's really interesting how that works. Not good for the bees, but it's interesting. Um, and then of course, uh, nutrition makes a big difference in how the bees respond to uh, all kinds of um, viruses and, and pathogens. Um, many of them go away when you've got good nutrition. So, or at least they go away more quickly. Uh, how, how do the bees deal with uh, um, issues we talked about, in, ad, innate and adaptive, individual immunity, and then social immunity? Okay, so just a review there. Um, yeah, and then of course, hygienic behavior, which is what we're, there's a lot of work going on trying to uh, raise bees that, uh, and, and breed bees that have a hygienic um, nature to them so that they are uncapping and taking out the bees that are parasitized or infected. infected. And then uh, um, if we can get the bees to do that on their own and do better grooming, um, then, then you don't need the treatments to try to, to take care of um, Varroa and some of these other things. So there's a lot of work going on in this area. Uh, to try to improve the hygienic behavior of bees. Um, part of that, if you look here, there's a circle around this brood group. Uh, they've uh, killed this um, with uh, liquid nitrogen or CO2 or some cold material. And then they look at how fast and count how many of these get removed in a certain period of time. And what ends up happening is, uh, if the bees are have really good hygienic behavior, they're going to hear, they're going to sense that these are dead, and they're going to take them out of the hive. And how how effective they are uh, can be measured then very directly. And the different uh, genetic lines of bees, you want to get the most effective bees at removing this uh, these dead bees quickly, and uh, detecting and and removing. So pretty cool way to to actually have a, a concrete measurement of uh, how, how effective your bees are at doing this. One of the problems that I know that they've confronted at this point is, is getting it to pass on from generation to generation. You can get a queen that, that uh, has good genetics, uh, but almost uh, within two to three years, 
uh, a lot of these things go away because they will mate with other drones and we reproduce and even produ reproducing from that same colony, uh, we're trying to get the genetic traits to uh, be amplified and, and be able to uh, carry through as a, as a uh, stronger genetic line. But it, right, for right now, it doesn't seem to carry through. At least that's what I've read. Um, responses where work, social fever, again, uh, really interesting. Bees have two sets of muscles. One is vertical, one is horizontal that uh, basically control wing motion. But if they fold their wings back and they just vibrate these muscles, it's the same thing that we do when we're working out. You feel the muscle get hot as it's working. Uh, they do the same thing and that's how they generate heat. So, uh, and, and they can generate actually quite a bit of heat as a group. Um, they can really uh, um, um, push to get the hive heated up. This is also one of the things that really um, causes a collapse in a hive when they don't have the numbers uh, to, to create enough heat in the brood chamber, they will, um, basically you can have a queen with a hundred bees and they just can't produce enough heat to make any, make any brood. Um, so it, it is possible to just have a hive die because there aren't enough bees in, in there. Um, years ago, I had a hive that I had a situation like that, about uh, 200 bees and a queen in the spring. And I just swapped that, that hive with a uh, strong hive. So all the field bees came in and within two weeks, that hive with the, with the, um, the weak hive was uh, able to heat up and they, they were full of brood and, and going strong. So um, it, sometimes it's just a temperature thing. Uh, if workers detect a fungus that causes chalk brood, oftentimes they'll they'll heat up an area just to dry it out and to make sure that uh, um, it doesn't continue on. And strong hives with uh, with that warm temperature don't generally get uh, chalk brood. They they're going to get it only when it's cold and in the spring and winter when the bee population is low. All right. So we already talked about how they use the the uh, the method for testing self-removal. Um, yeah, so really this is just more about uh, removal of the dead bees. Um, that's a hygienic behavior that we really wanna promote. And I'm, wow, yeah, we're right on, on schedule here, I think. Yeah, um, we are. So let's, uh, let's go to questions and then we'll go to break. Okay, uh, so there's a question about 5G cell towers, uh, which can kind of be a lightning rod and kind of divisive issue, but Pete, have you ever heard of any in, like resources or research papers um, about 5G um, EMFs like affecting honeybees? You know, that's an interesting thing. I, I Yes, I had somebody who was pretty adamant about the concerns and um, the uh, here's uh, my background in in physics and engineering tells me that um, electrical magnetic radiation uh, varies with the square of the distance. So basically, if you have an emitter that is emitting, um, you know, basically it's an antenna so of some kind or an electrical field, uh, it, 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 if you're more than, a, you know, e each point you go, you drop by it and basically um, the square of the, like if you're two feet away, you're uh, four times less likely. If you're six feet away, you're 36 times less likely to, uh, to be affected. And by the time you're six feet away from any, any source, um, you're really at a point where there's no um, no serious impact. Um, we used to think about this when we had CB antennas, when you had uh, ham radio operators with large uh, electromagnetic, you know, uh, signature. It was a big issue uh, if you were standing next to the antenna. Um, it would, there are um, 
this is just, again, this is my personal opinion. So I, I'm going to say you need to do research on your own. But uh, I, I think that the, the level is so low. And if you're away from the source, uh, even six feet, you're, you've got no, no issues. That's my take. Um, until I see research that says that there's something, some connection, I'm, I'm sticking with that. So um, it, uh, as a, a source of radiation, 5G towers, uh, the, the point is the tower itself, I don't want to climb a tower that's radiating anything. But if I'm standing 100 feet away from that tower, you know, I'm, I'm way out of the range of, of any radiation from that. Um, high tension power lines are the same way. You've got a lot of electromagnetic magnetic radiation there. So I hope that helps. Uh, it's just that, well, you don't, I wouldn't build my house right under a high tension power line either, you know, 10,000 volt power line. Um, you're going to get a lot more radiation from that than from a 5G tower. So I think a lot of these things are, are designed to scare people and sell stuff, books and things. That's just my take. Next question. Yeah, I'll also ask Alina about that one too to see if there's- Yeah, please do. I, I mean, I'm, I'm giving my opinion. I have this, this is all my opinion, not- yeah. Okay, next one is, can stinking help with building tolerance of allergies? Is what? Does stinking can it like build your tolerance against allergies? Like if you get stung more, oh, like, can your allergies? Uh, great like, question. Lessen? Great question. I think that's stink therapy. Um, if you look at arthritis, um, it is a reaction to your body. Uh, the um, what's it called? It, but it has to do with your uh, your body's reaction, uh, swelling, and, and so forth. So what happens when you when you have sting therapy, as I understand it, again, this is just my, I'm no doctor, this is just my understanding, is that it, it uh, activates your, abil your body's ability to um, be less reactive to uh, allergens. So basically what you're doing is you're, you're creating a situation like if you do sting, sting therapy on, a, on an arthritic joint, you are activating your body's um, circul you know, the circulatory system and various things that actually help heal that area uh, and, and certainly make it less um, uh, inflammatory. It's the inflammatory reaction. So um, from that standpoint, yes. Um, if if it's if bee stings help your body, uh, I'm going to live to be a thousand years old because I get stung. <laughs> um, I don't know for a fact that uh, you know just getting stung. Um, you know, I, I think you got to really look at the medical research. And another question for Elena, but I yeah, I, ask Elena. And also, I can say that I know that you know some people that get stung by bees and that it actually get their allergies get worse. So, but there is, sting therapy is a thing. I think, uh, you know, you need to go to a doctor and they need to do it in such a manner where it's controlled and they give you small amounts and then they increase. Yeah. So th there's some, it's not like you just have bees and you just have them sting you and you get better. It could get worse. So it needs to be in a more controlled yeah. and, manner. And for that matter, uh, there, there are therapies for all kinds of allergens, including uh, bees, where if you are allergic, and, and let's make sure we understand that this is the way I understand allergy. If you're reacting where the sting is on your, and it gets stung on the arm and you, and you react there, generally that's a, a, a localized reaction. And that is not the kind of allergy we're talking about. If you get stung on your arm and your throat swells up, you get hives, you get reaction away from the sting site, that's the true allergic reaction that Systemic. we're considering as being dangerous, right? But even if you do that, if you have that kind of reaction, you can go to a doctor and they can help you work through that to become less reactive to, to the bee stings. So there are therapies uh, that can help you uh, work through some of your allergies to make it better. But you have to talk to the doctor. Right. Great. And then uh, I think 
we want to take, we can ask questions and uh, I don't mind just staying and, and answering questions, but people want to take a break. You probably don't want to do that. We're at 11, 10 now. So should we, what should we do? Take the actual I'll see you. Yeah, we can take the actual break. I know we have a lot of questions, um, but you know, if, if break is also important, so um, they can take a break. And then at the end, you know, if you have extra time, eat. Um, we can yeah, that definitely. I, I'm, I'm going to look at this real quick and just make sure I'm in. Yeah, yeah I, I'll do my best and I'm happy to stick around after and answer questions. So let's okay, let's just take uh, take five minutes for people. Okay. That's good.
All right. Do we get a poll answer to the polls that we took? Did we ever go? Yeah, we did. Um, I think we didn't include zero as an option, so it's a little bit skewed, but we still get somewhat of a feeling. Um, let me see if I can pull it up again. There we go. Okay. So for how many hives did you lose this winter? 60, like 67 percent of people said one, so zero or one. Um, and then seven percent to said two, and then twenty five percent said three or more they lost. Okay. And then how many hives do you currently have? Fifty percent of the people have five or more hives. Wow. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Good group. Yeah. A lot of knowledge. A lot of knowledge. A lot of experience. A lot of knowledge. Yeah. Well, I hope I'm I'm doing this uh, doing them doing them service here. Um, one more question, and then we'll go on. And I'm going to try to blast through this in a half an hour so that we have a full half hour and more if we want to for the um, for the rest for the rest of the questions. Okay. Um, yeah, so this was not in order, but it's a terminology question that I think should be answered. What do you mean when you said checkerboard uh, brood? Good question. Uh, there's some good um, information. I'll, I'll give you the references here in a little bit, but um, <clears throat> checkerboarding is when you, you have a box that's full of uh, brood and uh, honey and pollen. Uh, you open it up and you look at it this time of year and you see, oh my gosh, I've got to, I've got to get ready because this hive is going to swarm. It's just got too much in it. Um, so what you do is you start pulling frames and either move them into an upper box or into a split. And the frames you put back in are either drawn comb, empty drawn comb or empty frames. And basically what you're doing is you're, you're interspersing the empty frames in that uh, brood chamber so that you um, uh, make room for the queen to lay eggs. And that's that's called checkerboarding. There's some great information from Wally Shaw, from Stephen Rapaski, uh, various uh, Richard Ball, all, all have different things. Uh, the uh, uh, text uh, um, beekeeper's handbook is a great one. It's got some really, really neat stuff in it. And I, I know Wally Shaw is a big fan of this. He's a, um, European beekeeper who uh, has a lot of um, a lot of following, and very very uh, uh, very good at that sort of thing. So lots of references there. Hope that helps. Let's. Uh, what do you think? Should we? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Kick it in high gear here and go. Kick it in high gear. Yeah, launch. Okay, here we go. Um, so this is the last section I'm going to do. Um, we're going to uh, run through it fairly quickly, but uh, I'm going to talk about IPM, which is integrated pest management. So really what we're going to talk about is uh, how to manage uh, pest and virus and various issues in your hive. Um, and, and, you know, just to make sure that as I go through this, that it's very clear, the label is the law. What I say doesn't matter. What Kian says doesn't matter. What's on the label is the way that we have to promote it being used, okay? So if if uh, you wanna use it in a different way, um, that's not what we're recommending. <laughs> um, uh, so always follow the instructions, correct dosage, grow colony strength, appropriate time of the season, appropriate temperature, if uh, able to use while honey supers are on, uh, that sort of thing. Always know what the label says and how you're supposed to use it. Uh, there is some evidence that rotating treatments on certain cases will help uh, to avoid resistance. I'll try to identify those if I can, but again, um, yeah, labels the law, right? And, and of course, checking to make sure that your treatment worked is important. Uh, oftentimes we do treatments and uh, just don't ever really go back to see, but it's important to check, make sure that what you did worked. Give you an idea of some of the history of this. Uh, what's happened with bee, bees in the in the United States since 1940? Um, basically, uh, beekeeping or bee colonies were going up. We had World War II, and the 
just since then, the, the amount of colonies in the United States has dropped off. Um, and, and, uh, and, and now we're kind of floating around uh, two, two and a half million uh, colonies in the United States. Um, we had some, a big break there when the tracheomites hit. We, we don't have that problem in California so much um, for various reasons, but uh, then the varroa mites hit in 1987 and you see another big drop off, uh, but yeah. Uh, colonies in the United States are dropping, but they're not, not really dropping by much anymore. I, they, there's a, a different way to look at this. Um, and uh, just to be clear, 2006 and seven was when the first colony collapse uh, right in this area where the colony collapse occurred. And you see that the population has dropped, but, but it's still pretty, pretty healthy, okay? So if we go here, we'll look at the, uh, the current information out of uh, Be Informed. They do a survey every year. Um, back in 2010, roughly, 2011, they started breaking it down by winter uh, and summer losses. And then there's a total annual loss. I made a line here where 50% is the blue line, uh, just to give you an idea. This is the backyard beekeepers, the sideline beekeepers, which is like 500 hives. If you've got uh, 500 hives, and if you have over a thousand hives, then you're considered a commercial beekeeper. So um, if in this case, what you see is uh, the trend is going uh, up, over the, for the backyard beekeepers, it's probably just a little steeper curve, uh, more losses in backyard beekeepers. Um, I think more people are becoming aware of this survey too. So backyard beekeepers are, are tending to respond more. And then sideline beekeepers, um, you know, it's, it's a little flatter and uh, commercial beekeepers are a little better at controlling things and, and have fewer losses. But so statistically, the commercial beekeepers are probably the, the most accurate, but they're all in that, right in that 40% range. I mean, you look at this, it's really interesting to see no matter what kind of beekeeping you do, however many hives you have, somewhere in that um, 30 to 40% losses is, uh, uh, is pretty typical, okay? Um, what about this United States overall? So if we look at this, uh, the map of the United States, you can see, that uh, there's some states like Oklahoma, Nebraska, uh, Indy, no, that's, uh, that's uh, Illinois. Um, just testing my geography here. Little one here, what's that, Jersey? I think that's Jersey maybe right there. Um, no, that's, uh, uh, okay, Delaware, right there, that little one, whatever that is, uh, some pretty high numbers. Um, What's California? 30%. So we have a, quite a variation in losses uh, around the country. Um, and uh, just a kind of an interesting way to look at how uh, beekeepers are performing around the area. All right. So what do you do about uh, co colony collapse disorder? Uh, or what, what, is, uh, what is colony collapse disorder? Um, they're, they've identified a specific set of symptoms, um, rapid loss of adult workers with disproportionately high brood population in the presence of a queen. Um, and so basically what you see is just a, a, a complete collapse, it looks like, of the hive. Um, there's not a lot of dead bees. So if you see a bunch of dead bees out in front of your hive, that's not generally colony collapse disorder. Um, what you see when you have colony collapse disorder is a fairly clean hive and they're just gone. And, and uh, that's what makes it such a mystery as to what's happened. Why, why did the bees fly out and not come back? Um, you have a delayed invasion by hive pests, robbing by nearby hives, uh, you know, they're just, it's just like something happened and they don't seem to, it's like they, they're, there's no clear reasoning as to why they've gone. And it's only reported by about 7% of beekeepers. So what's interesting is uh, that fits right in with overwintering losses and um, yeah. Uh, so there's, there's still 
quite a mystery. Um, it is, a, I think I said it, uh, it happened in the uh, mid nineties and, and, be, and, and it started and then really a lot of research in the early 2000s, up, a lot of the papers that come out were in the 2008 to 2010 range. And then uh, uh, we've kind of come to terms with uh, it's multiple factors. So there's a great paper, just a simple bioassay, uh, bioessay by uh, quite uh, uh, an impressive group of people. You got uh, um, Williams, Tarpey, Engelsdorp, uh, you got uh, Della Plain is in here, some really uh, high powered names uh, from people who've, uh, um, who have studied bees for a long time. And there's just a, they say there's a growing consensus that colony mortality is the product of multiple factors, both known and unknown, acting singly or in combination. Uh, considering the reliance that modern agriculture places on honeybees for pollination coordinated efforts, such as those of the Canadian Pollination Initiative, all these other ones, uh, list of acronyms, they urgently need to understand and mitigate these losses. Um, you know, there's some information on what we need to do, but Basically, the key is we still don't know real well what colony collapse is. And, uh, um, but the fact is that it's starting to look like it's a combination of things. And so, um, you know, you have to kind of isolate variables to be able to figure out what, how this works. So when we look at what's affecting the honeybees, there's a lot of different things. Um, this is a great kind of a, eye chart. It's it's hard to look at at first, but when you really focus in, it, it becomes kind of interesting that, you know, you look at the farmer's practices. What are they doing? How does that affect the bee food supply? Um, monoculture, field size, you know, if they have more or less uh, variety and, and quantity of food, what's happening with the climate? Uh, what's happening with pathogens? Um, as we move bees into the almond orchards, you pass, you know, viruses and, and various things, and and then you've got beekeepers that don't, you know, uh, uh, small-time beekeepers that may not take care of their hives as well, and so viruses and things get uh, transmitted that way. Uh, you got uh, how how beekeepers practice their beekeeping, um, acaricides, uh, which are you know the things that are designed to kill ticks and mites in the hive, uh, the, the varroa mites, what are, what are they doing there and how is that affecting the honeybee health? Uh, you've got residues in bee products, the uh, foundations, the pollen, the wax, uh, if, uh, if there's pesticides in a field, you bring your bees back with, uh, with contaminated pollen and uh, wax, you know, how is that affecting it? A lot of interesting things that all go into honeybee health. So just some things to consider. Um, what do you do? Well, uh, there's integrated pest management, and that's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes here is what's the approach. But before we do that, make sure your bees have good nutrition. I can't tell you how much I, I turn now towards when I see a hive that's died, I go in and I look, and, and sometimes there's bees there, and sometimes there aren't. And I, I was last year with a drought, I found out that a number of my hives had were loaded with honey, had absolutely no pollen stores. So I'm thinking, okay, did my bees starve because they didn't have any protein? Um, things like that, that, you know, observe what's going on in your hive. Know that they should have resources in there. And, and when, you're, when you're doing your inspections, think about that as you're going into the fall. Uh, do I have enough resources, both honey and pollen, to make it through? This time of year, if you've got frames that are extra of honey in your in your deep uh, or in your in your brood box, can you pull some of those resources for fall, set them aside and store them so that now when they're gathering all this uh, material, can can you set it aside and store it so that uh, in the fall you just drop the frames of pollen and, and honey back in, and then they can use that uh, in the fall for uh, instead of feeding your bees hard with, with sugar water. Give them natural food in there. Just thought. Decision making process based on understanding the host and pest biology and host pest interactions. This is a really critical thing. Uh, you, by understanding the, the pests in the hive, 
you will get much better uh, decision making on on how to deal with it. So know how a mite works. Know how a, a varroa mite works. Know how a hive beetle works. Know what um, you know uh, how viruses are moved through your hive and what what's causing that. Uh, oftentimes, uh, it all comes back to, especially with viruses, it comes back to good nutrition. But you know what are your tactics and how are you going to do it? Okay. Um, so there, there's a pyramid of tactics, and I'm going to show this slide several times, but I want you to kind of just focus on the pyramid. It starts with cultural. The base of the pyramid is what are you doing with feed, sanitation, culling comb, resistant bee stock, break and root cycle, all the things that you can do uh, in, to help the bees just have a good foundation. This is the, the foundation to all beekeeping is how are you managing your bees? Uh, then there's the physical and mechanical things that you can do like screen bottom boards, equipment. Uh, what are you doing uh, with, with drone removal, physical things? Um, one thing that's not on this that I just really promote is um, uh, robbing screens. I think robbing screens are undervalued. Um, we talk about them sometimes. Some people use them regularly. Some people put them on and never take them off. Um, but having robbing screens can really reduce the amount of um, uh, uh, robbing and uh, just drifting from one hive to another. Um, biological uh, approaches, nematodes and uh, BT for, for wax moth. Uh, nematodes, I, I'm not a big fan of putting anything in the hive like that. Uh, and, and you know, especially BT, but uh, I do put nematodes under the hive to, they, there's uh, ones you can get for your garden that actually kill, uh, uh, I, I believe they work well to, to slow down the hive uh, beetles because they have a, a part, this goes back to what I said before about knowing your pest and how to deal with it. If I can kill the hive beetles uh, in the spring, uh, in the ground, if they're in their uh, larval mode, when they're when they're uh, pupating in the ground, I can uh, I can use nematodes to do that, and then I don't have to put any kind of a, a treatment in. Um, formic acid, hot beta acids, the chemicals. Uh, there's some hard chemical. There's soft chemicals. There's hard chemicals that uh, that basically uh, just different uh, categories that uh, are about you know, controlling burrow and, and some of these other uh, pests. So, all right, moving on. Knowledge is power. Know what's going on in your hives. Look at the cost benefit. Depending on what your goals are, go back to goals, 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 goals. Uh, very important. What are your goals? If you if you have one or two hives, you may be willing to spend more on, on uh, treatment. If you have a thousand hives, you're going to be really cost conscious and you're going to be doing probably the same thing to every hive and doing a lot of prophylactic treatments. So really know your goals and your goals will carry you through to what the best management uh, technique you have. Um, know the host pest by, by pathogen biology, uh, know the symptoms and stressors, monitor for that, like doing your mite counts. That's really critical on Varroa to know how many mites you have. If you've got more than 10 hives, you may only need to check two or three of them. You've got a Varroa issue. It can be quite different. I know I've seen hives sitting right next to each other. One has got a lot of mites and one has got, you know, one might have 15 or 20% mites and the other one's clean. So I still wish I understood that issue, but it's a lot about the, the, uh, the way the mites reproduce in the hive and in the cells. And then again, hygiene, some genetic lines, the bees are, eat, are better at cleaning them out. So um, re replicate the ones that are healthy and the ones that are doing well. Make a note, keep notes on your hives and, and re replicate the ones, the bees that are doing well. You'll be uh, better in the end and all of us will be better if we can get a, a lines of bees that are, uh, that are healthy and, and, and don't uh, uh, promote, grow, you know, hygiene, they, they promote hygiene. You know, promote the uh, growth of the role. All right, uh, prevention rather than intervention, you know, preventive treatments if you can. 
Some co common problems in a, uh, California apiaries are Baroa mites, um, three to four mites in a, in a uh, half a cup of bees. Uh, three, three mites is 1%. So you get a half a cup of bees, you put them in your, your uh, uh, test uh, bottle and you uh, half a cup is 300 bees. So if you've got three or four mites, that's 1%. So the threshold kind of has been 1%. Uh, I know that some go two or 3% say it's okay, but this time of year, if you've got more than 1%, you're gonna have uh, a lot of mites by the, by June of this year that, that they will just keep reproducing uh, exponentially and you will have a lot of mites. And then it gets really hard to control and your likelihood of getting uh, deformed wing virus and some of these other things is really high. So know how many mites you've got and then uh, treat appropriately. Um, viruses, uh, visual, if you see deformed wing virus, it looks like this. Um, although this, this bee also has a couple of mites on its back, uh, there is um, almost never uh, see mites. Um, there's a really neat program. Uh, I don't remember the name of it. I'll look it up later, but um, the, uh, you can actually take a picture of the bees on the frame and this, uh, you send it off, uh, it comes back in about 30 seconds to a couple minutes, and it gives you a count of the number of mites. It's not perfect, but it's pretty cool. Uh, it actually uh, will give you a count of mites on your bees. And, and another way, just very quickly without doing any kill, just to give some idea of, uh, of issues with, uh, with mites. Um, I still like the alcohol wash the best though. American Fowl Brood, very important to understand this. Um, if you've got a smelly, you know, you, you, you get in your hive and it just does not smell right, kind of a um, dirty sock, icky, smelly, yucky smell. Um, you see larva that's, um, uh, you know, get car concave cappings, um, black scales at the bottom of the cells, looks like this. You get in there, take a uh, toothpick and you'll see it here. This, this is the end of the toothpick. Stir up one of those larva and if you pull it out and it's ropey like that, that's American Falber. And you need to call the county and you need to, uh, they, they need to know it and you're gonna need to take specific action. You wanna close that hive up, make sure that uh, um, you get that them called as quick as possible and they get out there and tell you how to dispose. Probably gonna have to burn the hive and they'll give you the permits and the, the way right proper way to do that. So. Um, but yeah, make sure that if you think you've got American fowl brood, reach out to another beekeeper, make sure that you know, and, and then deal with it quickly. It's very, very uh, uh, easy to pass from hive to hive. We don't want that out in our bees. Um, Nosema apis and serenae have been a problem in the past. Uh, I believe the new version of this is serenae, the one that's kind of taken over. And I have seen it in hives and I, anytime I've, I, I do this with a microscope, uh, you test it, um, you can do a, there, it's in almost all bees to some extent, you'll see little bits of it. Um, but uh, uh, when it gets bad, and oftentimes that's associated with stress and, and like package bees that just aren't performing, I've tested them and I found uh, a couple of years ago, I had two packages that I bought. Both of them had Nosema. Um, one requeened almost immediately, and one uh, uh, left. I think it, uh, I think it, the queen uh, kind of swarmed out. It was very weird. But uh, um, in any case, Nosema did, did not show this. The, the serenade was not uh, showing the diarrhea out front of the hive. It was uh, clean. It just was not performing. You'd expect a, a new package of bees to take off like a rocket and, and it, it really didn't. I was feeding them and it just didn't work. Okay, there's a threshold to uh, how much nosema you're supposed to have. Uh, you can reach out to different people. I know I do nosema checks for people regularly, but... Um, there, there are people who can do it, and certainly it's part of your uh, 
uh, process going through the master beekeeping program to learn to do that. All right, so we're gonna go back to cultural, um, just spend a little time talking about cultural control. What is cultural control? Um, change something here real quick. Um, cultural control uh, provide balanced nutrition. Uh, honeybees need diversity of pollen sources. One of the reasons why it's difficult in the valley is because of the monoculture and these crops. You put you put your bees out on almonds. That's great for February, but what do you do in April when and the, everything's starting to dry out in March, uh, in June, July, August? There's nothing out there for the bees to feed on. So you see a lot of the bees that do stay in California. You see a lot of them with feeders on. That's not good for the bees. You want to have multiple. Uh, uh, pollen sources, um, and then uh, that improves their immune uh, response and helps deal with pests and pathogens. So, um, you want to place your bees in an area with a, a wide variety of flowers, um, and, and if you have uh, the land for it, plant seeds and plant flowers that uh, support your bees. Um, and spot your bees in places where they can have access to good flower, uh, good feed. Um, there is uh, there are some really good uh, pollen substitutes um, that can help with that. Um, and I, I know there's a uh, probiotics, uh, pro DFM that work really well uh, to help gut health. Uh, all good, important in late summer and fall and throughout the winter to build pollen pop population and pol for pollination. Um, make sure, uh, this is a funny one, find a clean water source, but we all say immediately after that, that bees like dirty water. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure what the best answer to that is. Uh, provide a water source that, you know, doesn't have any toxic chemicals in it. That, that's, that goes without saying, but uh, it doesn't have to be like, really clean water. There is some evidence that having chlorinated water, uh, the bees really like it. Both uh, saltwater pool, I know they like my saltwater pool. They go to the little waterfall and, and drink there. Um, but, uh, and I have flower pots that they're just, whatever reason, they can have three fire flower pots in a row with a little tray underneath them and the bees will uh, go after one of them because it's got the right mix of minerals, I guess. Um, here's something that I, I did this year that I thought would share with everybody. January whoa. January 20th, I had a hive that was just doing fine. Uh, although you don't see bees going in and out, it's a still picture. They were, they were doing fine. And uh, this was from last year, and I had it lined up with a bunch of bees. So I put a piece of tape on the front just to kind of give it a, a different marking so the bees wouldn't drift from this, this hive. Uh, February 7th, I went out and I looked and there's poop on the front of the hive. I've got, I don't know, in this area, I've got eight hives on this apiary, right? There's two stands, one here with three hives on it. One, uh, you can see them here. There's one, two, three hives on this stand. And then facing it on the other side, there's four hives. So there's quite a few hives in the area. This was the only one that got this poopy stuff on the front. Um, I wasn't sure what it was. I went and checked it for nosema. It wasn't nosema. Um, so I, I cleaned the hive. I cleaned this off. And you can see that like this streak here that's underneath the handle, it's not on this one. So that this was cleaned off. Two days later, I come back and it's just pooped all over. I go, oh crap, I got to do something here. So I got a hold of some Pro DFM and I put it on uh, for two, two, two times. Uh, I think their recommendation on the label is a tablespoon and just sprinkle it on top of the frames. Um, the bees ate it up and March 2nd, I go back. Uh, I had cleaned this off. So when I cleaned this one, I had to take the tape off. And I came back on March 2nd and there's nothing. So that whole time from February 9th to March 2nd, it was basically gone. I thought that was pretty cool. So I share that with you. Uh, and it goes back to keeping the gut health in your bees strong really helps. Minimize path pathogen, path, pest pathogen transfer. Practice good hygiene while working. Use different equipment in different apiaries. Clean equipment often with 10% bleach or 70% alcohol. 
carry, um, I love to carry either uh, Lysol wipes or um, Clorox bleach wipes and use that to wipe my tools down, especially if I'm going into different apiaries um, around the Bay Area. Um, wash uh, protective clothing. If I'm in somebody else's apiary, I don't use my tools. I ask them if I can use their tools or that sort of thing so that I'm not sharing my pathogens with them. Uh, make sure you wash your clothing occasionally. Um, and then you can flame torch, hive tools, uh, that sort of thing. If you're reusing equipment, uh, know its history. Uh, my hives I've got from various places, but I, I mark them so that I know where that hive came from. And if there's a problem, I know that I, I can say, oh, I'm gonna identify all the hives that came out of this area and I'm going to uh, remove them because they are, might have problems. So that sort of thing. Just make sure you know the history of your equipment. Um, yeah, wash equipment, UV light's great. If you can, you know, that's basically, that's putting it out in the sun <laughs> for us. Uh, you can buy UV lights, but uh, getting that, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty complicated way to do it. Just put them out in the sun. Comb culling, um, getting, getting old material off and, and clean, keeping your hives clean. Uh, freezing flames works really well. If you can get it, even if you're putting them in one or two at a time, you kill a lot of stuff when you put them in for 24 to 48 hours. And of course, uh, if you just happen to have a, a gamma radiation uh, unit near you, uh, you can always throw them in there. <laughs> like, I think that's for, uh, there's, there's, they are around and it works really well um, to, to kill all the viruses and all the issues, uh, but we just don't have, my level, I don't have access to that. Um, Minimize pesticide exposure. Close your hives up if you think somebody's spraying around. Um, you know, make sure you know if you're working with farmers in the valley that you uh, you know when they're spraying. Um, yeah, and just if you're it, encourage people who are around to to uh, around your bees to uh, not spray. I always ask my neighbors, you know, I give my jar of honey and say, hey, if, if you're gonna spray anything on your on your flowers or something, let me know so I can close my hive up. And then that sort of, through that discussion, it usually encourages them to not, not treat uh, their flowers with, with harsh pesticides. Um, cultural control, um, again, this goes back to the, um, Type and type of, of, of queens that you have. There's uh, Minnesota hygienic, BSH, um, uh, bees, Russian bees tend to be uh, very hygienic, Saskatraz, um, uh, or you can breed your own. And that really comes from, you know, your survivors should be the ones that you're breeding to make the next uh, group. So uh, if you're in an area where you can breed your own queens, uh, make sure you're you're taking the ones that are the healthiest and and re queen you know using them to to revive them them and turn them into viable hives. Physical and mechanical uh, items that we can do. I like the robbing screen as I said before. Uh, breaking the brood cycle, caging the queen, splitting colonies, uh, all physical things you can do. Drone comb removal. Um, there's different ways. There's green frames that have drone comb um, foundation. It's just the bigger cells and the bees will do it. You take that frame out, you throw it in the freezer, uh, put it back in the hive. To me, that's, that's two motions too many um, because I've got to put it in, I've got to take it out, I've got to put it in the freezer and I've got to then get back in the hive or, or you know, rotate them, I guess I can do that. Uh, one thing I've learned is um, I throw a medium frame into my hive, about two frames in from the wall, and they build drone comb off the bottom. When I'm doing my inspection, I pull that frame. You can even mark it on top with a with a, a felt pen, and uh, you pull it off, and I just cut right down through the uh, uh, the drone comb. I cut it off and and throw it in my bucket. So. Um, again, a medium frame in, a, in, in my uh, deep super, 
and they built drone comb off the bottom. Powdered sugar dusting, uh, I've never had luck with this, but some people say it works. You're just basically encouraging grooming and you dust it all over the bees. Uh, screen bottom boards help you uh, prevent mites from crawling up. They don't crawl up off these things. So that's, that's, that's a fallacy, but uh, definitely uh, a screen bottom board helps because the bees, the, the bees, when they're grooming, they they knock the mites off, and they just don't uh, um, they don't come back. Uh, physical mechanical control. Um, also used for a small hive beetle. Uh, there's beetle traps, hood traps, west traps. Okay. Oh, I use. Um, Either the brawny towel, you can get the hardware towels at the uh, excuse me, towels at the hardware store for shop towels, or um, uh, what are they called? The little Swiffer pads, um, the ones that don't have any any liquid or any uh, any scent in them. You just uh, tear the Swiffer pad in two and lay some on the top. The the, the hive beetles, their little legs with the hooks on the ends, they get caught in the towel and and uh, die there. The little uh, the only beetle traps that uh, you want to be careful of are the ones that have two parts. There's a, a two-part beetle trap. You put oil in it, and and the bees will propolize it in. When you try to get it out, you pull the top off uh, because it, they, there's no other way to do it. And then when you're trying to get the the actual trap out, uh, you end up tipping it, and the oil pours into your hive. So I like the one-piece disposable ones. They're they're easier to get out. They're there, and you get them by the, the packages of 10 or 20. Generally, this is not a problem if you live in a dry area. Southern California, up through our area in the valley, hive beetles are there. They're always in your hive, but they're really not a, a significant problem unless you let them get out of control. Um, they don't reproduce well uh, in the ground. Uh, they're, they're part of their cycle is in the top four inches of soil. So if you've got hard, dry soil on top, they can't reproduce that way. Uh, if you live in the East Bay, uh, I know we're out here on the coast where it's moist and wet and the ground's loamy, uh, you can get a lot more problems with high beetles. So I've seen that too. So it is around, and this is a big problem in the South where I get summer rains and the soil is always wet um, or wet to some extent, then this can be quite, quite a big problem there. Okay. So then there's a chemical, and I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I try to avoid this as much as possible. For the first 10 years of my beekeeping, I said I'm never putting any chemical in my hives, and then I found out that if I wanted to really make a, a decent amount of honey and my bees to be healthy and over winter, that I kind of had to treat. So um, I had to start dealing with the mites, and, and when you do deal with the mites, you do uh, get a much healthier hive, and you produce ton more honey. I mean, it's amazing the difference. So I'm not a big fan of treating with anything. I'd love to be able to not treat at all, but I've learned that to some extent I have to. So here's, here's my uh, take on it. Um, these ones marked in green are the, are the chemicals that you can use in California. Although you'll hear a lot about oxalic acid, uh, it is dangerous if you're vaporizing it. Just really be careful. You're supposed to wear a mask and you're and a lot of people don't. This stuff gets in your lungs and it really is a it's not good. So um, uh, it's not legal in California because of labeling issues. Uh, it's certainly easy to get and it's cheap, but it's it's really not a to me, it's not the preferred method. Um, but I'm a small time beekeeper and I I'll just say if you're if you know, you're going to have to go somewhere else for information on that if you if you want to. You want, then there's plenty. Um, but uh, what uh, I have found, organic treatment, Formic Pro works really well. Uh, I, it's organic, and and uh, it's bees won't uh, become resistant to it. So it's something that I can use regularly. You just have to be careful about um, occasional queen loss because of temperature. Uh, so if your temperatures, and usually in California, we can find periods where it's down below 85 degrees, and there's ways to use a single pad. It comes in pads of two, and if you put two pads on, 
uh, your chances of queen loss are higher if you use one pad and then wait 10 days and put another pad on. Um, your chances of losing the queen are much, much lower and it, it very, very effective at not only killing the bees, killing the bees, killing the mites on the bees, the it's called the phoretic mites, that it also kills the, the mites inside the cells. So you're killing the, the mites that you really wanna kill with this are the ones inside the cells because that's the ones that are gonna come out and repopulate the hive. So very, very, to me, it's the most effective way to do it. I just, I'm a big fan of plumbing pro. Um, you can get hop guard. I don't, I don't use it, it's kind of messy uh, and stinky. Um, but it, it makes your hive smell like a beer. Uh, so, so you like that, hops. Uh, Amitraz, Apivar, um, I use that occasionally. Uh, it's very easy to use and uh, mostly on things like nukes and, and swarms when I'm just trying to treat the bees uh, fairly new and make sure that they're, they're healthy that way. So Apivar uh, to me is another viable option. It's not organic and you have to have the, the uh, Honey supers off when you're treating. And there's some more hard chemicals, we'll call them. Uh, Fumadil B for nosema. Eh, not, not, not a lot of uh, evidence that this really functions well. Nosema, to me, again, is a nutrition issue. If you, if you keep your bees uh, fed, healthy, and not stressed, uh, nosema does not seem to be an issue. So my first approach, and, and of course, when you feed the Fumadil B, they, you feed it in sugar water and you, and you um, uh, feed the bees. So if you're feeding them, guess what? You're probably gonna help their health that way too. So it's hard to say whether the Fumadil's working or the, or the feed is working. I always throw on a, uh, if I think I've got this problem, I would throw in the, the uh, probiotic uh, put a uh, pollen pad on and you know maybe treat the the uh, the syrup with some fumadil B just to be sure but um, generally speaking this goes away uh, as the spring wears on and summer comes the bees just get healthier as the as their forage and everything gets better so American fowl brood uh, boy you're not going to treat that uh, some some beekeepers professionals use Zeromycin or Thailand as the as the brand name you got to have a prescription and they just prophylactically treat to keep American fowl brood out. Um, probably not the best way to, you know, long term to deal with this situation, but that's that's just a, just so you know it's out there. Uh, European fowl brood can be treated. Uh, you don't have to throw away your, your hive. Uh, different symptoms, uh, best to know all these things, uh, you know, spend some time reading and studying these things. There's some good information in the camp website uh, and, and uh, you know, understand your, your treatment options there. Small hive beetles, you can treat it with check mite. I've, I've just had good success with, uh, with the uh, traps and the, uh, um, and the uh, Swiffer pads. Wax moth, uh, paramoth, it's not legal in California. So don't do it. So Pete, just a time check, just about 12. Okay, thank you. Um, pesticides identified, uh, there's a lot. So understand that your wax and the, and the hives uh, carries a lot of stuff. Always follow the label instructions, okay? Uh, make your decisions based on host biology, pest biology. There's some, I'll just show this. There's some great resources out there. Read, 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 read. Uh, and understand what's going on. Um, why use IPM tactics? Improve the bee health, increase honey production, increase pollination. Managing swarms, I'm gonna just touch on this a little bit. Um, there's some great resources for, for, and I just list them here so you can go back. Um, you've got, uh, you know, we talked about the distribution of uh, the high bee, uh, the, the uh, uh, Africanized bees. Um, yeah, and if you're doing, um, you want to do splits, um, yeah, make sure that you understand the rules and the laws. There's some great requeening resources, uh, video resources we recommend. Um, Karen Paulquin did a great one um, on requeening. Uh, actually, Robert Silverstein did it. Sorry, this wants to 
time out on me. Um, the uh, there's a YouTube video that Robert Silverstein did on how to requeen, um, and then Steve Rapaski's presentation uh, is is on requeening is great. It's about an hour, and man, does it go into detail. He's he's just a great uh, speaker and has just a ton of information. Um, books, I highly recommend Swarm Essentials. Uh, there's a whole uh, queen rearing essentials. There's these essential books. You'll see that it, it, it all have essential in the name, and then increasing with essentials by Lawrence uh, O'Connor, um, and then Swarm Control by Richard Ball. I didn't put in here. Um, um, the Irishman. Why can't I think of it? Kian, help me. Which one? The Honeybee Biology. Um, uh, do we care? I'll think of it. <laughs> I don't know why it's just that. But there's uh, there's plenty of resources out there um, to to uh, to go to for um, you know how to manage swarms and and what to do. All right. How about that? Right on time. Thank you, Pete. Okay. On behalf of all of us here, thank you so much, Pete. Uh, for spending your time to share all of your knowledge and your uh, your plethora of experience. And also thank you for all the work you do um, at Mount Diablo Beekeeping Association. Um, it seems like you are a person that really supports your local community and not only your local community, but the statewide community too here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's always a pleasure working with you. Pete is such an integral part of camp with the curriculum development, with the um, bouncing ideas off of just a really great person to work with overall. Um, so thank you for your time, Pete. Thank you, Kian. I appreciate that. That's very nice. And I, I will say again, uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me, um, I'm happy. I love to talk about bees, so don't hesitate. And so for follow-up, we will be sending a recap email, as I mentioned in the beginning of the call, and that will include include the recording and also a transcript of the questions and answers. And we thank you for respecting intellectual property law and cop copyright law and not sharing the recording that is sent. Uh, also, we have more upcoming classes if you're interested in more presentations like this. In three weeks, we have the Honeybee Colony. And so that is going to be at the Honeybee Colony level, learning about more detail about some of the things that Pete went over, like um, collective immunity response. Um, also, you learn a lot more about pheromones and the communication between uh, the different casts and the pheromones. So you'll get all the details on that. Um, so that's a good one to check out. Also, around the same time, I think the weekend after that, we have Queen Rearing Techniques Short Course. So if you want to learn, it's more of an advanced technique, but if you want to learn how to produce your own queens, there's multiple methods of doing it. And that's an in-person class. You come down to UC Davis, or up to UC Davis, and we'll show you the different methods of how to do that. And you actually get to come back if you'd like and take Queens home. So that, that one's a lot of fun and people love that every year. And also mention the certification program. Many people are probably in the certification program here, but the California Master Beekeeper Program has a certification program. And when you're in it, uh, you get free access to all these online classes. Um, so uh, if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. You also get to uh, learn all you need to learn to become a well-rounded beekeeper through the program. That's kind of the one of the big intentions of it. And also learn how to teach others like Pete is doing today um, with science-based information. Um, so we'll be sending up that recap email. And also check out the requisite chart if you want to know what classes to take later. And that's under the class uh, catalog page. Okay, so I think we can go into Q&A. If you'd like to uh, leave at this point and not join for Q&A. That's all good, but we'll do a little bit of Q&A for as long as uh, uh, Pete likes. So you ready for questions, Pete? I am. Okay, um, let's do it. So first question, when you do a walk away split, how far away do you place your hives? Mm, great question. Um, uh, anywhere from four feet to 20 miles. <laughs> I know that's not a, uh, not a clear answer. Um, I have done close walkway splits. 
Um, if you're going to do a walkaway split and you want to keep it close, yeah, going far away is just no problem. I mean, if you go even 100 feet, oftentimes you're good. I would I would rotate the entrance so that it's a different direction, no matter where I put it. Try to rotate it so it's a different direction than the original hive. So, like, if I have a hive on on two stands and they're facing each other, I would always take the one uh, that I split and move it around to the other side and and set it down. But I I um, so that they're they're, you know, the entrances face different directions. And then you've got to be careful because um, I want to close it up for a couple of days if I can, put a screen in the front so they can breathe. But um, I'm going to close them in there and just let them come to terms with the fact that they're in a different place, especially the one without the queen. And then uh, open the opening small and put some, put some um, things in front of it that make it look different so that it, it is a different entrance uh, uh, for the bees and they will reorient it, uh, to that. Uh, you will still get field bees that go back to the old hot. And it's important that if you, if you do that and it's close that you go back at the end of the day uh, that you open it and you look in and you see um, if you need to go back to the original hive, you might need to do this once or twice where you, um, you pull a frame uh, brood, uh, open brood that has nurse bees on it. So they're still feeding the larva. You just take it over and you shake the nurse bees off into the um, into the new location without the queen. So uh, hope that helps, but it uh, it's what we would do. If you move it far away, you know, uh, 200 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet to a, to a, you know, miles away, that's always the, the easiest and safest. But not everybody has that space. I know I didn't. Thank you. And are you? Inviting a swarm if you place the bees uh, when you split um, it like really close to the original location, like really close, I'm guessing. That's the question. Um, inviting a swarm. Well, I say sure. inviting is like uh, inviting it to swarm. To swarm. Yeah. Well, they more more likely to swarm if they if you do a split that way. I don't think so. Uh, you know, this is one of those things that. It, we're talking about my experience, so I, I don't uh, I don't do generally multiple splits out of hives. I, I'll just do a simple split, or maybe uh, pull frames, uh, checkerboard, and uh, pull frames out to put in a uh, in a nuke or something like that to build a new new hive that way. And um, so I would just say. I haven't seen in my experience that that uh, you get more swarming that way. Um, yeah, I, I would just say the biggest problem I've seen is is uh, queens that come out, especially once you've uh, moved the the uh, bees away. Um, they're going to make multiple queens in that box, and uh, the chances of swarming there uh, go up with. The, the, if there's a high number of uh, queens in that box, so you get uh, a lot of a lot of queens hatching at the same time in there. Then uh, I would like to cull it down to after they've uh, made queens in there. I'd like to cull it down to one or two um, queen cells, so that uh, you know, mm -hmm. usually I would leave two, so that there just is not as much chance of. Uh, multiple swarms. Okay. So what if the top box is too heavy to lift to do a walk away split? I would I would do a couple things. So if you're having trouble lifting your boxes, um, think about how high they are, the, the base is off the ground. Can you lower it a little bit? These are gonna be longer term things. Go to from deeps to mediums first, then mediums to eight frame. Um, if you have 10 frame, go to an eight frame, try to get uh, so that basically you're working with equipment that you can work with. Uh, it shouldn't be high, uh, so high that you have trouble lifting it. It shouldn't be. These are just things you need to think about in your goals for beekeeping. If, if you're having trouble lifting things and then ultimately you go to horizontal, you can do a Langstroth, horizontal Langstroth hot, which is just basically you have to get somebody to help you build it. But it's just a Langstroth box that's long, and so um, you just put all your your deep frames in 
that way. And then you're working all at the same level instead of vertically stacked. I don't think it's efficient. I don't think it's, you're gonna get as much honey out of a horizontal hive, but um, it is definitely a way to keep bees without having the, uh, the issues with weight. Does that help, you think? So, and what if the bees have built honeycomb between the boxes, making it hard to break it off without fear of hurting the queen? I'd say that again. Yeah, so if the bees have built honeycomb between the boxes, I'm guessing between the oh, frames. Right, right, yeah. right, between the boxes. No, it's between oh, the boxes because okay. they, they uh, especially this time of year, um, what you get is um, a lot of, of um, um, comb that just the bees are, or wax glands are going like mad because they're bringing in all this nectar and they start to put wax everywhere. And so they build between the boxes when you, when you break the boxes apart and you lift them up, you'll see you've just destroyed a whole bunch of drone comb. You uh, generally that's what they put in those spaces. And then is that, then what what was the question about? What do you do? Um, or yeah, if you break a queen, that, cell? you don't want to hurt the queen. Or if it's like hard to carry it because you know it has there's been so much honeycomb built between them, it's hard to like kind of. Break get them it apart is. and yeah, get them apart. Out. Yeah, yeah. Again, uh, some of this has to do with just going with smaller boxes. Uh, doing a, we had a problem this year, at least in, in my world. Uh, I try to get in quite a bit more frequently in the March time frame through through April because I want to avoid swarming. I'm going to be working my bees more every every ten days, seven to ten days. I want to be in those hives. So. Um, with all this cold and the rain, we couldn't do that. So we got a whole lot more of that kind of stuff. And, and I absolutely understand that some of the hives I went into, it was really hard to get those things apart. But a couple of things can help, a really strong hive tool. I mean, they make, go on and get, there's like $20 hive tools. They're made out of really good steel. And when you stick that thing in and you fry it, it doesn't bend. I mean, you can you can really get good leverage with it. So I I would recommend a, it's a bigger hive tool and it's it's stronger um, and it, it will help you with with breaking those apart. Um, if you uh, if you do have a lot of buildup in there, don't worry about hurting the queen because she's going to move. As soon as you start cracking that box, she's going to move up or down on a frame. So she's in a safe space. And then once you lift it up, make sure you clean that off so that the next time you go in, it's not there and, and they don't, uh, um, you know, it'll make it easier for you. Go ahead. Next one. Great. Um, um, um can I just ask something? If sure. You, yeah, sure. Uh, if you want to do like a walk away split, but you have a box that's so heavy, couldn't you put down a bottom board, put down an empty box that's the same size as the one that you can't lift, and yeah. then lift those frames out into that? Yeah, absolutely. That's. I, I'm sorry if I. Uh, yeah, sometimes I I kind of think uh, past the question and I interpret it wrong. Um, when I am doing an inspection and I'm in a place where I, I don't really have a table or anything, that's exactly what I do. I'll, I'll take the, the cover off. I will set the cover on the ground upside down and I will use it first. Uh, you can just set the, the, the box, the first box down caddy corner. And as long as I'm using uh, uh, supers, the, the, the boxes above the queen excluder, I just set the first one down uh, I know there's not going to be any any queen or brood in that in that box because it's above the queen excluder. Then I set the second one down. I take the queen excluder off, and I set it down. Then I set the inner cover on there. So now there there's no way if I put another box on top of that because I'm just reversing the 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 boxes. Um, I I can set the, the actually the the brood boxes down. I know the queen's not going to get that through that queen excluder into the honey boxes, right? So. You just kind of think through what you want to do, but absolutely you can use the, the top cover. And then I can use the inner cover to kind of temporarily cover the bees. If you're setting them aside and you're working on the brood chamber, doing an inspection, uh, it's always good to have either a cloth 
uh, or, or an inner cover over the top of your other boxes so that you don't um, disturb those bees. Keep them in the dark, keep them happy, um, and they won't come get, get uh, defensive. Does that answer your question, Heidi? Yeah, that's kind of what, what, I, what, what I was yeah. trying to troubleshoot. Yeah. And, and uh, occasionally, even if I'm just working really quick, I'll just set the hive, the, the box up on end. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, um, setting it on the ground and, and tipping it up. The bees will be fine in there. Um, just uh, I, I just tip it up and, and uh, don't want it to fall over by any means. But uh, if the ground is flat and, and uh, level, then it, it works well to do that too, just for temporary. I had one other question. Where I'm at, I'm out on a bluff up here in Northern California, uh, mm -hmm. Lolita. And our wind and weather has just been horrible with yeah. just a few spattering of sunny days. So on those sunny days, I've gotten in my hives to see what's going on. And they're, they're getting huge brood nests, but it's not warm enough to treat for mites. And um, what, what is your treatment? The Formic Pro. Yeah, then it's warm enough. It, 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 the, the problem isn't on the low end. The problem's on the high end. Oh, okay. And Formic Pro can slow down the, the brood growth a little bit too. So if you're concerned about mites and you've done a mite check, mm -hmm. this is a great time to be treating uh, with even two pads of Formic Pro. And, uh, you know, I always want to leave a little airspace in there and make sure you pull the, the uh, entrance reducer when you treat. You can't have an open bottom. Open screen bottom doesn't work with Formic Pro because it'll just, it, it all goes down and it will, um, it will just run outside the screen. So you got to have your, your bottom board has to be closed. But the entrance reducer should be taken out. So there's still some ventilation, but not just open. And would you Would you have an, a ventilation at the top of the hive too? Like no, no, I, I, I uh, tend to close those off. I do have, as long as you've got an inner cover, you can have a vent box on the top, uh, I think. But uh, you don't want real strong ventilation in there because that's what uh, that that's that smell is that that chemical from the form, formic acid basically the vapor from the formic acid is what's killing the mites. So you want a certain level of concentration in there. The biggest problem is in the first two days if the temperature is over 85, it gets so strong in that in that hive because of the high temperature it vaporizes a lot more and it, and it can impact the queen. And when the temperature is at 60, 50, 60 degrees, it's very slow and, it, and it'll be fine. And so okay. you should be in good shape. Good. Great to know. Thanks so much. That's yeah. awesome. Follow the label as, as I was instructed. How <laughs> 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 to follow the label. Yeah. But if you're ever concerned, you can always do the one pad, wait 10 days, put the other pad on. That's an option too. Yeah. I've, I I've like the, this so time of year, I like the two pad treatment. If I, if I've got, 3%, 4% mites this time of year, I'm hammering it because I know they'll make a new queen. I know the hive's going to be fine. And I want to make sure that uh, that I get those mites down because it'll be killer in the summer. If I've got 3% now, it's going to be 20 or 30% in the summer. Yeah, I've got four hives that are massive, massive. Yeah. And I've already started splitting them just because my, my queens aren't coming until next week. But I just started splitting them because tall hives in the wind and just to buy some time even though the weather's too bad for the queens to mate i didn't know what else to do well, it's not it's not you'd be amazed uh queens mate uh, uh, uh we always talk about the the book says the book says the book says but the reality is the queens i had i had a very good queen that made it in february during all that rain i i grafted a queen two queens into a into a uh, observation hive. Um, they both came out within two days of each other. The second one didn't fight with the first one, uh, actually swarmed. I got her and put her in a box and the original one in there, I just went in the other day and she's laying beautiful brood pattern and she was mating right in the middle of all those rainstorms. So. Hmm, interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it will work every time. I had a couple of queens that didn't do that. But the reality is just because we think somebody said on a temperature chart that it wouldn't work, 
it's not always they the did, case. A couple of them did last year, so uh, it's just been so horrible. But um, if you've got hives that are full like that, you're just on the cusp of swarming. I know. So you, yeah, you, I've you, been you. splitting them. <laughs> Any yeah. other questions? So we have a lot of questions. I think there's two things we can do. One is I can rapid fire them towards you and we can try to get through as many as we can with at least some response, or we'll just have longer responses and we'll just cut it off and then I'll answer them. Um, we'll in the we'll do the lightning now. round. Let's do okay, the lightning, lightning round. round. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Lightning round. Okay. So you said in SoCal, you don't want to be making your own queens. Uh, what is your take on queen beaters in SoCal that do free flight? mating um you're gonna have to go to elena and get that i'm not okay. uh, qualified to elena. and, and uh, i say elena but kareem Popwin. uh i don't know if i said that last name right but she's an expert go to her she reach out to elena, uh, to kareem and you will get the answer you need yeah and if you want to reach out to kareem actually she's one of the satellite leads so if you go on the camp website you click on about and then go to governing structure you can see her email. You're there. messing with my lightning round now. Yeah, no, we have to say. Okay. So do you wet the newspaper you place between the supers when combining? I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Do you wet the newspaper you place between the supers when oh. combining? No. Okay. Uh, do you have a sense for how long the queen pheromone will last after putting her in alcohol? Putting it in alcohol. Uh, about... Uh two tenths of a second to three tenths of a second just long enough when her head goes under she's done <laughs> I you know I thought that too but I just realized I think maybe they're talking about in the hive it's like the pheromone the residual pheromone in there okay well that's different yeah. two, days. two days two days okay um what does robbing look like oh I got a great picture I, I can't share it with you because I'd take too long to find it. But yeah. um, if you want to reach out to me, I'll show you. It's It looks like swarming, but the difference is the when you're swarming, they're coming out. When uh, there's robbing, they're going in and they're all over the hive. They're at the uh, upper, the, the um, telescoping cover, or uh, if you have a... Uh, uh, you know, any kind of structure on the hive, whatever, whatever your setup is, where hive, whatever, they'll be all over it, front and back, and they are just pouring in. It's it's like a swarm in front, and they're just pouring into the thing. It's crazy, but you can once you see it, you will never forget. It. It's it's crazy. Um, if you're just seeing a few bees, um, you put a uh, um, robbing screen on in the summertime when the dearth is going on and you will you will identify how many bees are trying to rob because they don't go in through the, the top, they go right at the opening and you'll be able to tell pretty quickly how much robbing you're getting. I highly, highly recommend robbing screens in the summer. Next. So we had a brutally wet, cold winter. I dry fed my bees and I'm wondering if, um, can I dry feed? year round? Yes, but it doesn't do much good. Generally speaking, the bees won't take it when they're when they're not hungry. Uh, for they, they prefer natural food to um, dry food. But there, there are absolutely places where it depends on where you live, where you would need to feed uh, year round or, or close to it, um, especially in the valley where you have monocrops. Uh, once, once the bloom is off, you've got to feed to, to keep your bees alive. So, but if you're in a, in a, in a residential area with a lot of different forage, I generally speaking, I never fed for 10 years. I just, I got enough honey and I got enough uh, food pollen all year long. All depends. Go ahead, next. If you swap the location of a small population hive, will the foragers try to kill the queen? If you do what to the hive? Swap the location. Oh, swap the location. Like, um, yeah, I'm not no. too sure either. If the no, oh, okay, no, 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 I they no. won't. Okay. Um, that's a that's a great question. Um, if you if you have a weak hive and you think everything's good, but they just are weak and they need more bees, um, as 
you just take the strong hive and I, I have it on a, on you know four hives on the same stand. I'll just take the strong hive, move it over two feet, and then put the weak hive right where the strong one was. And they just it's like they're they're part of that hive. It, they it, I don't understand quite why, but the foragers with food uh, don't ever seem to be unwelcome. It's like that's like what drifting is. You get the bees coming back from the flowers. And they, they, if they've got food and they come in the entrance, the other bees are happy to see them. So for whatever reason, it works. They don't try to kill the queen. Go. If you do a walkaway split, how far? Okay, that was already asked. Um, how far do, what? Uh, to skip, uh, just disregard that. Um, do the bee informed partnership reporting annual losses include combining smaller colonies or is it only the true uh, ones that die you'd have to go through the research i'm i'm better okay. ask alina i'm not i'm not sure about that uh, how often should i conduct mite counts oh great question um i would do it uh once a month uh if you have one hive i uh, wouldn't do it more than once a month um you know 30 to 45 days. Um, if you're treating, you if you if you do your count and you treat at the end of the treatment, I would do another count. So let's say you're using Formic Pro, I would go um, put it in uh, two pads. It's going to go 20 days. Uh, then about day 30, I might do another count just to see. And I would wait if you have to treat again. I would wait 10 to 20 days between treatments. You really don't want to hammer the bees too hard, too quick, too frequently. So. so what is the best method for cleaning mold off frames? Or do the Ooh. bees clean it themselves? I, I, I hear this a lot. You're supposed to put those frames back in and the bees will clean it up. I And I've seen it, they will. But for me, the, the best way is I take a garden hose and I spray that mold off it comes off real easy some of it gets kind of locked in the hot and the frame then i take the hot it's full of water i just take that frame and i bang it a couple times shake it turn it over shake it get all the water out if i can and i have time i'll leave it out in the sun to warm up and, and evaporate and then i put it in the hive and i found much better response to that than just putting a moldy frame back in the hive i don't i don't like doing it. but washing it off Works pretty good, and if you're really concerned, just hit it with a five percent bleach solution, and and it'll kill a lot of the the uh, spores. So there's that too. Okay. And where do bees defecate? Outside the hive. They don't defecate in the hive, and that's why when you see them get sick, like they like I showed that one uh, picture they will come out of the hive and poop. If you see poop in the hive, you've got a serious problem. There's something wrong. Uh, that's what uh, you know. we used to see with the nosemas, nosema apis, they would poop inside the hive. That's that's a bad sign. So what I and have just to, print, oh, sorry. Sorry, just go back to that real quick. Bees that poop on the front of the hive, they're still trying to clean it. And that's what's really wild. When I was looking at that, they actually, we're in there picking that poop off. And when they're doing that, they're reinfecting themselves. So you really, uh, it's, it really shows how bees can keep something going if that once they figure out that, hey, this is not right, it's not clean, I wanna clean this up, and they're just reinfecting themselves. So if you see it on the front of the hive, you need to get that, if uh, you just take your scraper, scrape it off, go over it with a, a Clorox wipe, uh, some alcohol, bleach, whatever you can, wipe that stuff off, wipe your tool off now that you've used it to scrape. And then, boom, then, you know, then if you're using some kind of probiotic, they get better. So, but if you're just letting them continue to eat that stuff, they're not going to get better. Go ahead. Next. Can I store frames with nectar and honey in 55 degree cooler? Yeah, you can, but you don't need to. I wouldn't. I think your chances of crystallizing that honey are much higher. I would keep it in a in a just freeze it and then take it out after 24 to 48 hours and put it in a dry area. Uh, and I mean, it depends on where you live, what the ambient temperature is. But I don't I don't try to store mine in a cold area because I don't want it to to crystallize.
to me, I, I, this is just me, crystallized honey in a frame is worthless to me and to the bees. I don't, I don't, I don't want that. Next. What is comb culling? Comb culling. Did I say that? Uh, I think it's like uh, comb culling, like removing it with the pick, with the comb color. Removing it with the what? Like the pick, like you scrape it all off. I think that's what they're referencing. Yeah, I guess. I, I'm not sure that term just for some reason it's not registering with me, but um, culling, comb, uh, you know, you may, uh, part of uh, keeping your hive healthy is rotating your your frames and stuff. So you want to call, call means to remove, right? So if you're calling comb, to me, that says you're you're taking it out of the hive and throwing it away. Um, generally speaking, the rule of thumb is every, uh, some to say two, three to five years, you want to rotate your frames out. If they're starting to turn black, I just do that anyway. Just throw the full frame out if you can, if you can afford it. If you really want to try to save frames, you can you can put them in bleach, you can, you know, but they're all propolized and, and it's hard to get anything to penetrate. So um, every three to five years, you probably want to just get rid of stuff. Next. Um, I think, you know, they probably meant drone culling, not culling. Oh, okay, drone, that could be. And, and culling drones is what we talked about before. Uh, basically, you're using that, the, the mites prefer uh, drone brood to, to, to reproduce in. So basically what you do is you put a frame in that is designed to grow drones. The queen will go in, she will, they will build the wax out and then the queen will lay eggs in it unfertilized and raise drones and you take that out um, every 20 days you go in and you pull that frame and you uh, uh, put it in the freezer don't don't have to scrape it you just put it right back in the hive and the bees will remove the dead drones and take them out of the hive you'll see them sitting on the ground around and, and you know sometimes you'll see them flying off with a dead drone yeah that's culling drones. Thank you. Uh, so you had a mite measurement of five to 10 mites on a sticky board. Could you explain that? No, if they're, I, sticky board is a funny measurement. Um, if you got five mites on a sticky board, you got 10 or you got 500, uh, there's two factors. One is you got mites, so you know that. Uh, to me, that says I should, I should be doing a, an alcohol wash. Um, and and if I and it then it depends on the time frame. If it's 24 hours, if it's 48, if it's a week, you know how long have I, has it been since I was in that hive? Um, I do have sticky boards in, in quite a few of my hives, um, and I look at them, but I don't use that as my criteria because if if you have hygienic bees, they're going to be and there's mites coming in, they're going to be kicking them off, right? They're going to be grooming, they're going to be taking them out of cells, they're going to be forcing the mites down onto the sticky board, so. I can have very hygienic bees that don't need to be treated if I've got mites on the sticky board. So I, I still like to go back and look at uh, mite counts uh, as my primary way of looking at it. Okay. But sticky board is definitely a way and a lot of people use it. Um, it's just my preference. And what about planting hops? Uh, so, will the bees get what they need to fight off the mice when they forage hops? I've got hops in my yard. That's what I thought. I don't know, but I'm, I'm trying it. <laughs> it's fun. Okay. <laughs> Makes my garden. If you take one of those things and squish it, it smells like beer. It's fun. Um, I thought about throwing some in my, uh, my uh, top of my hive during the winter, just to kind of, um, you know, in my uh, absorbent material for, for overwintering. Um, but I, I, I play a lot, so it's always fun. Raise some hops and see what you think. Tell me how it works. Have fun. That's, that's rule number one, have fun. So, okay. I need, you yeah, can skip that one for now. Uh, can I introduce new queens while the hive is being treated for mites? No. Okay. 
I am treating for mites with Formic Pro on the 20 day program. It is projected to hit uh, 85 to 90 uh, degrees on day seven to 10. Should I remove the strip and wait for the temperature? Don't to worry. Drop? Really, it's the first two to three days is all you have to worry about. I've treated multiple times, even with two pads. If my first two or three days, uh, if I'm going to do a two pad treatment, I want three or th plus days where uh, the temperature is below 85. And I like it in the 70s, really, if I'm going to do that. But if day you know, four through 20 is going to get up to 105, I'm not, I'm not so worried about it. Um, it's mostly that first few days and, uh, you know, yeah, just don't close the hive up completely. You want to make sure that that uh, entrance reducer is open, wide open, so that the bees can ventilate as they need to. So uh, when working on a walkaway split and adding queen cells from the same hive box, what is the best for waiting to open the split hive with queen cell frame? If, if you know that the queen cells really, it's important when you're putting queen cells into a hive in that situation to make sure that you leave a gap so that the bees will not bridge to the next frame. If your frames are too close together or they, you actually pack them, there's a, a cell and you pack your two, your, your frames tight, they will bridge across that queen cell. And then when you pull your frame out, you just tear that queen cell off. So make sure that you, if you have one that's in the middle of the frame, that you separate them enough so that uh, maybe you can take a frame out of the hive. Uh, they're not going to be building a lot of comb in that situation. So leave them separate a little, uh, and and uh, and then when you pull it out, you'll know. And mark on your frame which one has the queen cells on it, so that you know, um, you know, it, it's there, and you don't make a mistake and pull that frame and squash it. Okay, last question. Um, okay, so I need to make the 10 frame deep versus medium decision and want to maximize the commercial compatibility in case I want to um, get into sidelining later. Lots of sites say that commercial beekeepers only use deeps, uh, but just as many say mediums. What is the actual most commonly used size for like sideliners, commercial beekeepers? Yeah, that's I, I I am not in that business. So what I would say would be my impression from everything I've learned, uh, but it is only my impression. So I'm going to just go with that. The uh, the people with a thousand to ten thousand hives almost always use deeps. There just is way too much equipment in mediums. You can't you can't survive that way. So, uh, and then they have uh, equipment on their flatbeds that allows them to, to lift, you know, basically lift equipment, automatic uh, motor driven lifts, and they can pick up a, a, a pallet or they can pick up a hive and, and set it on the property. So um, if you're gonna be in that business, I would first check with the people that you think you're gonna be dealing with. Um, so you're not talking to me, you're talking to the people you're actually dealing with. And then, um, but my, my impression would be go deeps. Deeps are gonna just be uh, much more, and migratory covers. You're not gonna use it in cover and a, and a uh, telescoping cover because you wanna stack them close. Uh, you use always migratory covers. And solid bases, nothing fancy on your base. Okay, let's see if there's anything else. And I have one question, if you don't mind. Sure, Joy. Go ahead, Joy. This is related to the queen cell part that you're saying right before this last question. So uh, after the queen cell is placed on a hive, the split hive, the empty one without queen, uh, how long is to come back and recheck if the queen was able to come out and make give it a week, two weeks, three weeks? So that's when I go back to my queen calendar, right? So whatever stage you have, whether you're, you're grafting into a cup or you have a queen, you want to write down in your notes what stage you think that queen was. If you grafted, you know 
if you uh, took a cell out and you're put, putting it in on a frame and then doing yeah. your split that way, then you guess, but you know within a, a fairly good time frame exactly what it is. And, and then you um, basically, you have to predict. And that's why I said, you got to know that, that timeline because um, if you know that you're, uh, you, you, you had some cells and you think they were uh, capped, um, I don't know, maybe they were ca I think they were capped three days ago. Well, then you've got, uh, you're at day nine basically, right? So you got seven days till that queen is gonna be born. So I'm gonna think, okay, well, I wanna check on that on maybe in eight days and see if that queen was born and 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 make sure then basically I'm gonna look at that queen cell and see if it's open. At that point, I may go in and say, oh, well, I miscalculated. And all I see is the queen cells in there, but the, just the end of it has been completely removed wax. And, and, um, and it's, it looks like it's just about ready to hatch. Then I know I'm just gonna very gently put it back in there and let her hatch out. And I know now that she's, I've got a time timer on that. I say, okay, well, she's gonna be mated. Uh, if she hatches tomorrow, then I've got, uh, that's day 16. Well, and then she's got four days to uh, get ready to mate. And then another five days to be mated and ready to go. Then I am day 25, day 28, I'm gonna be, back in that hive looking to see if she's got uh, starting to lay eggs, that kind of thing. So uh, you get the idea here. You're, you're yeah. always trying to use that timeline to tell you where you are in the process, to tell you what you're going to, when you're going to go in and look and when you're going to. Thank you. I hope that helps. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? That will do it. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. Thank so you. Great, wow. great questions. Wow. I'm, I'm very impressed. Good group. Got down to just the really serious people now. I'm still with us. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Like yeah. For everyone's like was... like PowerPoint torture. <laughs> That's it's not PowerPoint. torture. But everyone was still here. If you have the chance, we'd really appreciate if you fill out the feedback form and the email. And also when you close out of Zoom, I think it should auto open it. Um, and you can say thanks to Pete there. Because we we all look at that uh, feedback. So yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Love to hear I'd love to get your feedback if you think I did something. Spent too much time in one area. Uh, I'm sure that we could all use that. So, or not enough in it somewhere. Of course, if you have any questions that you want to reach out to me directly, I'm I'm happy to do whatever you know, help you in whatever way I can. All right. Good. Thanks, Pete. Uh, when you get the chance, could you upload the updated PowerPoint? I think we're good. Okay. Have a great rest of your weekend, Pete, and everyone. Yep, you too. Take care. Bye now. Bye.